Welcome to Monwar Recaps, spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. Huge shout out and special thanks to the channel members. The Monwa starts off, by introducing us to the world of the dead, Necropia. It is devoid of a single trace of life, yet a grand castle stands upright in these barren lands. The sole castle of Necropia contains things that cannot be fathomed. Endless golden pillars, beautiful ornaments, and murals. The marble hall sprawls out beneath the intricately crafted, glorious sculptures, and the symbol of absolute power, the master of it all, the absolute ruler of Necropia, Death King Karnak. He, who transcended all, and controlled death itself, finally realized after a century that humans were not made to control things such as death. In his human days, Karnak had been the bastard child of a fallen noble family. He lost his mother young, and faced pressure from the other nobles, and grew only to trust himself, strengthening his body to gain respect. Then he came across a forbidden codex pertaining to necromancy, and steered off the path of a human. Soon after, Karnak drove every human and the kingdom to death. The fourth martial king, and the three grand mages, resisted him, but it was all futile as he converted them into his own subjects. The guardians of the world also tried to stop him. Fantasy World Avengers, but when he turned the final remaining guardian of the world, Dragon Emperor Grateria, into his subject, he converted his own flesh into the ultimate descendant, Astra Shaf, and the strongest death king to ever exist was born. We hear him saying he thought it was all his, and he'd finally be able to enjoy it, but it has been 70 years since then, and he wonders what he can do with a body that's only made of bones, and that he doesn't want this pointless act to continue. He says that he misses the warm breeze outside, and the warmth of other humans. Even digging straight into his own flesh, like gouging out his eyes, would be better than this empty life that he is fulfilling now. But there is still hope because he has a plan for something even larger. The footsteps of some knights can be heard as a man greets Karnak. He is the head commander of the legions of death, named Barros. Karnak tells him that preparations are ready, and Barros asks if it's finally time. Karnak laughs, saying yes, and he has a good feeling about this one. Barros starts getting super excited about it, and Karnak explains that he has been searching for a way to recover the pleasures of flesh using Barros's help. He's tried vampirism as well as possession, but pleasures work by fulfilling what one lacks. For the ascended like them, no method could fulfill their needs. However, because they were the ultimate ascended, they could find a way to recover their pleasure. They cannot enjoy human pleasures because they are not human. He must turn back time to the days when he was. Oh boy, we love regression. He says he will probably go back to the time when he first gained the mana of darkness. Barros asks what will happen if they fail. Barros asks if they fail, does this mean their existence will disappear? Karnak asks why it matters, asking if he still has regrets. Barros says he does not, and laughs, and says it's all or nothing. Time to let this shit rip as they both touch onto their stone tablet. Karnak starts to think about the life he lived when he was a human. He begins to slowly open his eyes to a blonde-haired man telling him to please wake up. The man asks if he's awake now, and Karnak says that's a familiar face, asking Barros if that's him. Barros says yes, and it's been a while since he's seen his face, and says that his scrawny, pompous face looks just like he did in the past. Karnak says he still has no sense of respect. He gets up off the ground, saying that if they arrived at the right time, then this should be when he got the darkness mana. He looks down at a table, confirming it, saying this was the start of everything. He walked the path of necromancy with knowledge from this codex. He decides to give it a try. He snaps his fingers as a purple aura stretches out towards the book, enveloping it in flames. He tells Barros this is all the power he has now. Barros asks if it's really okay to burn this, and Karnak says yes, as he remembers it all anyway. While it's a forbidden codex, it's not really that important. It's just the basics. It's better to get rid of it than to leave a possibility of someone else finding it. Barros says he sees that he's planned everything out. While Karnak looks proud. Barros, says he looks more handsome than usual. Karnak stares at him, and they have an awkward silence for a second until his stomach rumbles. Karnak says he has not heard this sound in forever. Barros asks if this means they can finally enjoy food, and they exit their little cave, super excited to find something to eat. It jumps to a tavern as we hear Barros yelling at the top of his lungs, saying how gas this food is. Some of the other patrons of the inn look at him a bit concerned while he sits there crying about eating bread. Okay, it's Karnak as well. Loki did not expect that, as he is bawling his eyes out, saying that he might have a heart attack. But they can't die over this early in their new lives. Barros says gambling their lives was so worth it, and it tastes so good. Karnak is also crying, and he says that he knows how he feels, 
but needs to watch how much he eats, as money doesn't fall from the sky. At a nearby table, the waiter puts down a whole roasted chicken. They instinctually both turn, and can't believe how beautiful it looks. Karnak contemplates killing everyone at the table to take their food, but Barrow stops him, saying that they'd be beaten up with their current physiques. Karnak realizes he's probably right, Barrow says that being poor is a sin. He goes to open their bag of money, and is completely surprised, telling Karnak that there is a problem. Karnak asks what's wrong, and Barrow says that their time travel had an effect on things. Karnak says that it's definitely strange, and Barrow agrees, saying there's no way they would have this much money. Karnak begins to wonder where things went wrong. At the time, his family, the gestured family, had a poor financial status, and his grandfather, Baron Greylid, started many businesses with the territory as collateral, and failed, and only left debts for his father, Baron Crayput. Unfortunately, his father did not have the ability to handle the ever-growing debts, and his original wife's two sons were helpless brats, and could not aid the family. He, the bastard child, who was born into the collapsing family, received all of this family's scorn and persecution, barely managing to endure each day. At least that's what the family state should be. So he's genuinely curious as to where the hell all this money came from, and that this isn't something to be happy about, saying maybe their time regression spell went wrong. Barrow says he's not sure, asking what a swordsman is meant to know. Karnak starts scratching his head, saying maybe they didn't come back to the past, but says it's odd as there are many similarities with his memories. Barros then says this means they can eat chicken, and their entire mood starts to change. Karnak says there's no point in not. Barros says they should at least order one, and Karnak says hell no, we are ordering one for each of us, and they ask for two whole chickens. Later in the afternoon, we see Barros has turned into a pig, and he is very round now, while talking about going into a food coma. Karnak says the sheets are calling his name. Barros says the fact that he had to see that again is kind of annoying, the family must be the same as ever. Karnak says they'll be fine as long as they suck up to him, but the problem is how strange the situation is. Barros agrees, saying it's not just one or two things that are weird. The horse too is strange, asking if he saw how the stable manager was glazing him, and it makes no sense that a fallen family would have horses of such a good breed. The citizens they bumped into earlier as well, they usually would bark at them, yet they were super surprised as they treated them super kindly. Karnak says it's definitely an uneasy feeling, and lets out a sigh. Barrow says they'll figure out once they get home as they were almost there. Karnak looks at his family's estate, saying it makes him nostalgic because he hasn't seen it in a while. Barrows is still just annoyed. We learn that Barrows was also an orphan, so he didn't live a comfortable life. His parents were absolute scumbags who abandoned him in the middle of the night when he was a child, and Karnak discovered him starving alone on the streets, and after he brought him to the family, his father allowed it. Even if he's an illegitimate child, the family had to save face, so they allowed Barros to be his servant. Barros then snaps him out of his thoughts, telling him to look over there, saying it's definitely the gestured residence. Karnak says obviously, but they see it's super fancy, and Barros says maybe they came to the wrong place, but Karnak says no, it's definitely the same as his memories. There's a tall brick wall, a two-story building with a terrace, and an extensive garden that surrounds it. It's all the same other than the fact that it's super well-maintained, and looks very clean. Karnak wonders where they got the money for this. One of the guards calls out to Karnak calling him young master, and Karnak is surprised that even the gatekeeper is welcoming him. One of the other guards reminds him that's not how we should address him, and then they bow, calling him their lord. Karnak and Barros are completely taken aback, wondering what the hell happened. Sometime later, we hear a man saying it's already been half a year since he became the head of the family as he's pouring them tea, and he asks if they've achieved their goal. He is the head butler, named Jeppel Pleed. Karnak is confused by what he means by goal, and Jeppel says surely that's why he went on a journey. Karnak says yes, and Jeppel's happy, saying that the late lord and lady would have been glad. Karnak is surprised that his father and stepmother are both dead. We also learn that his two younger brothers have also perished. Jeppel says that he feels better now, knowing that the family is in good hands. Karnak now realizes why he's become the lord, and wonders why his entire family died. The goal of his journey is obvious. It must have been to master necromancy while nobody was looking. Barros says it's odd he doesn't think Karnak would reveal his goal so openly. Karnak says that must be why he said some bullshit about going on a journey, but asks why he would need necromancy in a situation like this. Jeppel asks them what they are worrying about in a super bright tone. Barros explains that Karnak is exhausted from the journey, so maybe they can talk tomorrow. This bro deserves an Oscar. 
Jeppel apologizes, saying he's failed to consider that, and tells him to please rest in his room, and leaves. They high-five in celebration that Jeppel is now gone. Barros says they got out of it for now, but they'll have to deal with it later, and everything he said was brand new to them. Karnak says there's a good method for times like this, saying surely he knows what they need to prepare for now, and they should hurry and move while everybody is asleep. On cue, nighttime rolls around, and we see Jeppel sleeping in his bed, and Barrow says he is completely out of it, and he's prepared the herbs, giving them to Karnak. And Karnak says it's time to commence the mind inspection now. He begins to imbue his aura into the bowl, creating a black miasma that starts to seep into Jeppel's nose, and he says to awaken my servant. Jeppel instantly opens his eyes, saying yes, master. And Karnak tells him to explain the whole process of Jestard's finances, and how he became the head of the household. Jeppel says four years ago, while the second young master was training, he coincidentally came across a large-scale copper mine. Karnak says that he thought mines were just an excuse that nobles used to hide dirty money, and Barrow says he guesses this was one of those rare cases where they actually did. Karnak asks how his entire family died, and Jeppel says the problem was the location of the copper mine. It was located in the neutrality zone between the Gestured family and the Deventer family. The two families claimed that the mine was theirs, and this conflict led to a war between the two. The Deventers had always been consistent with their military plans, and were too powerful, as there was nobody who could defeat Sir Randolph, and he slayed Crayput easily in battle, and even killed the oldest son of the family, Tessel. The household's best knight and the second young master lost his two legs because of Sir Randolph, and due to this, he took his own life. The Baroness was shocked by all of this, and passed away not long after. In the end, young master Karnak was chosen to be the successor despite being a minor, and the two families then promised a ceasefire until he was of age and became the official head of the household. However, everybody was concerned about the copper mine and the promise of compensation for the war. That is when the young master Karnak came up with a solution to save the family. He requested a trial duel against the Viscount de Venner, in the name of Alium, the goddess of moon and justice. Karnak is so surprised by this, and Barros says that's rash as hell. The trial duel is a duel carried out under the mandates of the Alium order. It is possible to substitute a warrior in your stead. It is carried out under the presence of the Alium priest and the Deventer, and the victor is only declared through the death of one side. Barros says that Karnak dug his own grave, and Karnak sighs, saying it wasn't even him. No wonder everybody likes him. Barros says it's a losing fight. That's why he must have chosen this path instead of continuing the war, and Deventer could not have refused since it was an offer that would ruin their image if they did. If he won the duel and secured the copper mine, it would have helped them avoid starvation. Barros says with his current skill level, he is definitely going to die. Karnak says that's why he's going to do his best to prepare, asking Jeppel when the duel is, and Jeppel says it's only a month away. His neck starts to hurt, and he says that's way too damn close. It jumps to a table full of food, and Barros asks what this is. Karnak says he prepared it for him, as he's always worked hard, so he deserves it. He starts to eat, asking if it's fine for him to be resting when the duel date is so near, and Karnak says that he should attend in his stead. Barros realizes he was only given this food as a bribery, and says that he doesn't think he can do it. Karnak begs him, saying he's killed three of the four martial kings, and Barros explains that it was only due to his necromancy, and you don't gain martial prowess from just experience alone. He explains how it's meaningless to learn advanced swordsmanship if you don't have arms, and he would be able to do it if he had half a year, but there's no way he could do it in a month. Karnak takes the food away, saying to stop eating then. Barros asks why he doesn't find someone in the Night Order. Karnak says he wouldn't be here if there was someone talented enough in the Order. Barros says he only has one choice left, that he has to use his necromancy, and now he understands why he learned it. Karnak says there is a problem though, that necromancy is banned. He asks Barros if he remembers when they were on the run in the past, and they managed to eliminate the household stealthily by using necromancy, but the priest of the Alium order singled him out as the culprit, as they were certain he was a necromancer. After being stopped by some knights, Karnak begins to call down some wandering souls to erase the fates of the living using the light of the abyss. As we see him summon some wraiths, everybody instantly realizes they were right, and he is the necromancer, as he is using black magic. They start to fly towards the priest, who try to use their guardian plaques, which are of the Alium order. But their blessings are futile, as we see them get cut in half by the wraiths. Karnak swings his hand, sending the wraiths towards the knights this time, instantly knocking them down too. Karnak tells Barros they gotta go before the rest catch up, 
and he wonders how they knew he was the one using necromancy. Barros reads it, saying it's only civilians, mages, and knights who would not know, and he thinks people like the priest are an exception. Karnak is surprised by that. Barros laughs, looking back on that, saying it was a really rough time, but he understands what the plan is now. Barros says they should get some money and run. Karnak says that would be a shame. All of the family members he hated died, and the people like him here. Barros asks if he plans to keep up the act of a good old patriarch, saying he can do that and he'll just prepare for his funeral. Karnak says it's not an act, and tells him to sit back down, saying it might be dangerous, but he does have an idea. It jumps to the northern fort of Deventer, as he sees men training, and they are all super gassed out except for one, who is Randolph. Somebody asks him how the preparations for the duel are going. We learn that his name is Bright, and Randolph asks why he would need to make preparations to get somebody so unskilled. Bright says that's true, but he shouldn't let his guard down. And Randolph says it's just ridiculous that he has to waste his time like this, because of a spoiled young master who doesn't know anything about the world. Bright says he doesn't think Randolph would lose, but the new lord must have some kind of plan, for sure. We see a merchant selling stuff outside on their yard, and Bright says it's so distracting, telling everybody to get back into their positions. It turns out the merchant is actually none other than Barros, who says that he understands the plan. Barros says it was good that he decided to snoop around here. And Randolph might be powerful in combat, but in a one-on-one -on -one battle, his opponent actually has a chance of winning. He is the simple foolish type who uses typical heavy sword techniques. And he has not even learned Aura yet. It's easy to predict the movements of people like him. And it's a good thing he came here. And there's still at least another month until the duel. But he doesn't think it's enough time. A woman then calls out to him asking if he has any business with her brother Randolph. He gets really excited asking if that means she's his little sister. And she says that she is asking what business he has with him. He says that he was taken in by the vigor of the North's strongest knight. And shows her all of his handkerchiefs asking if she wants one. She picks one saying that one looks good. And Barros hopes that she didn't catch on to him. Back at the drill hall of the Jester estate, Barros says he's returned asking Karnak if his stamina training is going well. Karnak has died and this is now the end of the Manwa. Barros shakes him telling him to wake up. And Karnak tells him to stop before his meal comes back up. Barros asks if he ran 50 laps like he was told to. Karnak says yes, but he collapsed and he can't run anymore. Barros says his stamina is severely lacking. And Karnak asks if there's a reason for him to train like this in the first place. Barros says he can't do anything with his shrimp-like body right now and it's not meaningless so keep it up. Karnak says he needs to rest first. Barros gets all serious saying the real training starts now. Karnak asks what he was doing just now then. Barros tells him that was only rehab as it's time to begin the real training. And Karnak sees him as a devil. 20 days left until the duel. The first thing they do is to eat a filling breakfast in the morning. After that they go to the drill hall and do 100 push-ups. And then they match that with 100 pole swings. And then 100 squats. And after that, a break. Bro is cooked. Then after they eat another heavy meal, more push-ups, more pole swings, then squats and repeat. We see there are now 15 days left until the match. And he is now upgraded to using sandbags as weight for his squats. Barros says it seems like he has finally built some stamina up. And Karnak says of course that he has trained so much although he is still lacking compared to Barros. And Barros says that's because he has done twice the training he has and it's time to start the swordsmanship part. Barros hands him a sword and then starts to think about it saying it's a mess. Saying that his arms are trembling and he needs to relax his shoulders and he starts to instruct him how to fix his stance. Karnak follows his instructions and calls him strict but Barros says that he is finally looking decent and if he maintains this stance he won't be defeated in one attack. Barros then tells him to prepare himself as he is going to attack him now. Karnak says that he is ready to counter. Barros swings at him but Karnak was too slow to do anything as he gets hit in the stomach. Barros asks what he is doing telling him to get back into his stance. He swings again but Karnak fails to block it again and again until he is finally knocked down onto the ground. All from Barros only using a pole. And he says this is the reason why knights can have a field day against civilians. They don't give their opponents the chance to counter attack and he needs to hold his stance and dodge the following attack. Karnak says even if he does that he can't dodge it. Barros says of course and to be honest the goal of this training is to show his fighting will to Randolph and Karnak asks if there is a need for him to do that in a duel. Barros explains that Randolph has a habit of showing off so he will try to show his skills in front of the spectators while toying with his opponents. 
However it's different if his opponent loses their will to fight and a drawn out fight will damage his honor so if he notices their will is lacking he will instantly behead them and that's why he needs to show him that he won't give up. And if he does so he won't die off rip in the duel. Karnak looks very nervous and now we are 5 days until. We see him charging forward with a shield in his hand now and he swings at Barros who blocks it telling him that he can do better than this and then he swings at Karnak who backpedals telling him to scream louder and to make sure he is hurt. A follow attack comes up and Karnak blocks it with a shield and gets sent flying across the arena anyways as he rolls into a wall and Barros tells him not to even dream about taking a hit as he will just be killed and he must always roll on the ground. Karnak's gassed out saying that he is going to look stupid. The next day Barros swings at him and Karnak does exactly that by rolling around on the ground. Same thing on the third day as we see him rolling, but even faster. Now with two days left until the fight we see him roll away from the attack but manage to get his stance back. Karnak says he might end up dying before he even fights Randolph. Barrow says with this he thinks he is just about ready and it's time to move on to the final part as he now has a sword as he is going to teach him the four martial king's sword techniques. Karnak is surprised that he even knows such a thing and Barrow sighs saying he knows most techniques and the four martial kings were all his underlings after all. And he has learned every one of their techniques except for the martial king Rapizel. Karnak asks why he didn't learn hers and Barrow says that he never turned her into a death knight. She resisted till the end so he cut her in two thirds and made her a palace gatekeeper. Karnak thinks about it wondering if he did, saying that sounds very cruel. Barrow says what he will learn today is the Martial King Levon Delphiad sword technique. Karnak asks if it is possible to do that with the last two remaining days. And Barrow says they only need one to begin with. D-Day has now rolled around as we see the arena on the border of the territories and, some of the citizens from Deventer are talking about how one-sided this is going to be while the citizens from Karnak's side are all rooting for him since he's been training a lot. On cue, Karnak appears saying it's time to get started. As the crowd starts to get louder, somebody slams a pole into the ground, Gandalf pulls up and slams a pole into the ground. Both houses have claimed ownership of the copper mines, and thus requested a trial, and this will decide who takes it. He calls forward Karnak of House Jester to come and face the goddess, as well as Sir Randolph of Deventer to come forward. Before the fight, according to the rules, a handicap in equipment has been applied based on the fighter's abilities. The priest asks that they both plan to fight honorably, and they both swear upon it. The priest says now with the warrior's pledge, may the scales of justice seek out the truth, and it's time for the trial to begin, as we see them staring each other down. They finally take some space from each other, and Randolph says this isn't going to change anything as he charges directly in, attacking Karnak, who manages to block the attack, saying they'll only know once they see things through. He swings at Randolph, causing him to backpedal, saying he's glad he's not all talk. Randolph charges forward instantly, coming in with another attack that Karnak blocks with his shield, and the citizens are surprised that he's putting up a decent fight, saying that they knew something was different about him. Barrow says it's going as expected, he starts off not so threatening, and he can easily tell that Randolph is still scouting his opponent out. Karnak says this is good, and he should stick to what he's trained for. Given that, now he will show his will to Randolph as he lets out a war cry, telling him to come at him. Randolph smiles, saying his eyes are full of determination, and even though his skills are lacking, he is spirit. He decides to take it up a notch, as he begins to use some sword energy, which is separate from aura. Karnak realizes this, and says he, can't block this with his shield anymore. Randolph's attack comes in, but Karnak manages to roll away using his maximum speed roll while screaming. He catches himself getting back into stance, still letting out his war cry, and Randolph wonders what the hell that was. The crowd starts to laugh, saying he rolled out of the way, calling him dexterous. Some of the priests watching say that's one way to do it, but that's not what they expected. Karnak then throws his shield away, saying that he doesn't even need this anymore, and says Randolph is as slow as a turtle, and a muscular pig like himself dared call himself a knight. Randolph starts to get angry, calling him cheeky, asking if he is mocking him saying that he'll make sure he can't open his mouth ever again. Karnak smirks, telling him to try his worst, and takes a stance. Randolph is surprised as he recognizes it as the Delphiad sword technique, and so do some of the others, as it is the Martial King Levon's sword technique. Some of the citizens say it seems like their lord has been using the Martial King's techniques, and he might actually win. Randolph laughs, saying that he almost fell for the taunt and he just needs to stay calm and focused, as the sword techniques of the martial kings can only be used by geniuses with real battle experience, and he's far from capable of using it. He doesn't know how he managed to learn it, but if he thought it would guarantee his victory, 
he is mistaken. He commends the effort, at least, and he points his blade at Karnak, saying he will enact justice in the name of Allium. Karnak realizes that his bluff isn't working, and that there won't be enough to take him down. Back to when he was learning, he asks Barros if one day is really enough, and Barros says he just needs to copy it. Saying he won't have to pick up a sword ever again once this is over, and he just need to show his skill enough so people think he's been training a lot, as the real plan lies elsewhere. Karnak begins to block some of the attacks, but each and every one is very heavy, and he says that Barros never warned him about this. Karnak manages to trade blow for blow with Randolph, saying that he still has to do what needs to be done. We see him crying manly tears, saying this is nothing, asking Randolph if he really thought this would defeat the bloodline of House Jestard. Randolph wonders what this idiot is saying, saying he's getting completely bodied right now. Karnak continues saying that the sword of Jestard will never fall, and the citizens start to see him in a whole new light. They ask why they ever thought about him negatively in the first place, and Karnak asks Randolph if he is scared while the citizens sit there and start crying tears of respect. Barrow smiles, saying he's not taking any direct hits, and all the time spent beating him up is paying off. He always did have a talent for shit-talking, as that is all he's been doing to Randolph since the start of the fight. Randolph says he's way too irritated to keep this up. He tells Karnak it looks like he's on his last breath, asking why he's even yapping. He charges in much faster than he is before, saying that he's going to end it here. Barrow says it's finally come, and tells Karnak to brace himself. Karnak realizes it must be the chance. Back to the training, he explains that even if he can mimic the moves without a proper strike, everybody will see through his attacks, and he'll show him exactly what to do. He explains that Randolph is going to go for his legs to end the fight, and he's going to do that to limit his movements. At the right moment, he needs to shift his stance towards a defensive one, and stab his sword into the ground. Randolph is caught off guard that he actually blocked it, and then Karnak immediately starts to swing his sword at a diagonal upwards, which actually collides with Randolph's blade. He then quickly changes his grip, striking yet again, actually hitting Randolph directly on the chest. As Barros explains, it's called the double uppercut overkill. Bro is banned from naming ever again. As Randolph's blood flies across the arena, we see Karnak extremely gassed out, and Randolph laughs, asking if that's all he has, as it was just a minor cut, saying that a kitten could scratch him better than that. Karnak wonders if this is the end, and everybody else starts to think that the match is already over and that miracles don't exist. Randolph says that he let his guard down, and he's sure he'll be made fun of by his fellow peers. Karnak says that he's risking his life right now, and yet he's still concerned about him. He begins to smile, saying this isn't so bad, and he won't have to feel sorry for him afterwards. Randolph wonders what that strange expression is, and then we see his cut beginning to have a purple flame appear out of it as it grows straight out of his chest towards the sky. The priest instantly recognizes the aura, and Randolph begins to cut it away. Karnak charges in, saying no matter what kind of dirty tricks he's using, he won't lose. Before Randolph can even react, his leg is kicking towards Karnak as the necromancer aura is wrapped around his leg. He kicks Karnak, destroying the terrain as he gets sent flying through the crowd. They start to wonder how a human can possess such strength, and ask if the black aura is being controlled by him. Barros pulls out the Oscar performance, saying that it's necromancy, and this must be the power from the devil. The priest then tells the knights that they have to go and defeat Randolph, and they leap at him, telling him to stop this instant, as in the name of Allium, they will bring judgment and justice against unclean beings. He asks what they're talking about as he swings, knocking them all away. The priest manages to catch himself outside of the arena, saying this is definitely necromancy, and they need to stop him. Randolph wonders what the hell is going on and what Karnak did to him to cause this. He spots Karnak grinning, saying he must be confused, but he shouldn't be causing a scene like this. The aura begins to tighten up around him, trapping him. One of the knights tells the priest it looks like he's being controlled by it, but the priest says it's only because he's unskilled at controlling it, and they have to kill him when the chance arises. They start to scream while charging at him, thinking this is that chance, and Randolph cries, saying no, and gets impaled by all of their weapons, causing him to spit up blood, and at the same time, the aura dissipates around him as he falls to the floor dead in the arena. The knights tell the priest that he's no longer breathing, asking what they should do. The priest says they need to send officials to the estate of Deventer and have them investigated thoroughly, and a verdict has been reached. The fighter of Deventer has called upon a dark power yet has dueled in this holy trial. The other fighter, the Baron of Jestert, has claimed victory. Back at the estate, the knights are saying they have found items, as there are blankets and cloaks with necromancy symbols on them, and it's all throughout the estate. 
His sister pleads with them, saying that these were all bought recently from a peddler. One of them asks what this suspicious bottle of medicine in Randolph's room is, and she says that it's just a hair growth formula that they got from a merchant. As Randolph has always been worried about going bald, me too brother, me too. One of the men tells her that she will soon have a hearing a few days later it jumps back to the estate. As Karnak asks Barros how it is to eat a feast fit for champions. Barros says it's amazing compared to what they ate while training. Karnak tells him of course, it's a feast to celebrate their victory. Barros asks if it's okay to eat like this. Karnak says he's sure there's also a feast going on in the town square. Barros asks him how he came up with such a spell. Karnak says he didn't have to do anything. It only worked as well as it did due to Randolph's personality. A whole month ago, we see Barros asking him how he plans to use necromancy. And Karnak tells him to listen. It's the same whether he dies while getting caught using necromancy or during the trial. It would be better if one were to use it. And surely he won't be using it himself but rather Randolph will be using it. Barros asks what he has in mind. Karnak says he'll have to put up an act, and with how far the officials are, he should be able to fool them. In a situation where they're fighting, it'll be hard to tell who's using the spell. It is an incredibly strong and high-level necromancy spell, so even the Order won't suspect that he was behind it. There is just one issue. If he wants to do this, he needs his opponent to spill some blood. But with his current skills, he doesn't know if his blade will come close. Barros tells him to wait, saying that if all he has to do is make him bleed, that he can do it. Of course, that's not what happened, and Karnak says that he had such a horrible time. Barros asks if he isn't glad that he put so much effort into that. Barros says there's something weird. Randolph would have easily been able to win without necromancy, but they were somehow able to escape any suspicion, asking about the investigation against the Deventer family. Karnak says that they were convinced that he used it. Barros asks why. It jumps to the Grand Temple of Allium, specifically the Jessalyn branch. The High Priest is asking the guy from the fight to report everything that has been confirmed. He says from experience in their investigations, they are certain that it wasn't an ordinary necromancer, and using the fragment of the transcendent, the goddess warned them that the attributes match perfectly, as this is the darkness of the apocalypse. Karnak smiles and laughs, saying it looks like luck is on his side in this life. He and Barros start jumping, saying the world is in their favor. Barros then says with the Deventer family gone, there are plenty of powers that will try to take over the mine, and Karnak says that's why he needed to strengthen his necromancy in the first place. Barros asks what his plan is if the order were to find out, and he says that's why he needed to find a way to use it without getting caught. We get a whole three-month time skip as Karnak is training inside of a magic circle, saying that he has to focus as an aura is going into his hand. He starts to talk about how he's absorbing the negative energy from the moonlight and the darkness as well. He has to call upon the corrupt energy and filter it, collecting only the pure energy that is left behind. Finally, after he reprocesses it to create magic, we see the black aura turn into a reddish flame, and he says this is perfect, as it actually worked, and that this is called chaos magic. It jumps to the training area as Barros is fighting somebody, saying it has been three months since he started training as a soldier. In order to become an official knight, there is no helping it. But the problem is that the abilities of the soldiers are pathetic, as we see him fighting a senior soldier named Gilamone, who is extremely gassed out while Barros is not. He tells Barros to stop, saying that they should end things here for today. Barros says sure, then thanks him for giving him his time. Gilamone laughs, saying that makes him embarrassed, and he is the one who needs to be learning from him, and that he has grown at an incredible rate, and he will soon be the strongest knight of Jestert. Barros says that he still has a long way to go. Gilamone calls him modest, saying he will definitely be a good knight, and the soldiers are getting a drink together, asking if he would like to join. Barros says he has sadly been assigned to an important task. Gilamone says he should try to come tomorrow then. Barros agrees, telling him bye. We see him barging into the room, telling Karnak that it is snack time, only to narrowly avoid imminent death. Karnak tells him to knock first. Barros asks what that technique was, saying it didn't look like necromancy. Karnak says he is sharp, and it is difficult to consider it necromancy, and is more akin to mana, as he begins to show the red aura floating around. Barros says it is only possible to use mana if you switch your power. We finally get some lore and learn that there are four ways to transcend a human force in this world, a knight's battle aura, a mage's mana, a cleric's divinity, and necromancy, which deals with the force of darkness and death. The transcendent force accumulates only the energy that is suitable for the force in your body, and once enough has been accumulated, it will be transformed into power. Because a power is optimized to what suits the user's soul and body best, 
you cannot use another power once your soul has already been bestowed one. So Barros asks how he changed it. Karnak says that he didn't, and rather it is just the second stage. Karnak explains further how necromancy, which uses death energy and corrupt energy, is literally very dirty mana. That's why he works well with this since he had a bad upbringing. But there are foods that are made using nasty methods, like cheese, that have also been processed, so they don't feel gross or dirty at all. In filtering away the original negative emotions, like hate and grudges, leaving only pure energy of darkness and death, he transformed it into mana, and that is how his chaos magic was completed. From its appearance, it looks very similar to normal mana. Karnak says at least that's the name he gave it. Barros says, don't care, didn't ask, but it does feel close to mana. And Karnak says it will be okay for him to pretend to be a mage from now on. Barros asks if he will be able to mimic the amount of strength he had back when he was the king of death with just this chaos mana. With a lot of power comes way too much responsibility, and he ain't for that Uncle Ben shit. All he needs now is enough power to protect his territory. It jumps to the western forest of his territory, as we see some wolves all dead as they have been brought out from the mines. And Gilamon is telling everybody to get ready to go back, and he'll make the report himself. A wolf surprise attacks him, and he's too slow to react. But luckily, Barros leaps forward, knocking the wolf away, saving Gilamon. Barros says he was a bit late, asking if he's okay. And Gilamon thanks him, saying he feels reassured having an official night here. And Barros laughs, saying it hasn't been long since he became one, and it feels awkward and embarrassing, but recalls Gilamon mentioning how the monsters are strange. We learn that the wolves are called snarls, and they have gotten at least twice as strong, and that there is a rumor going around. Barros asks about it and Gilamon says it's called the Goddess Oracle. The Oracle of Destruction that the seven goddesses who protect the world and humanity sent down to the Order. Emptiness will open its mouth and vomit a fate that is not allowed. This will be a darkness that erases light, a darkness that reaps life. In time, hardships will arise, and wrong beasts will obtain wrong power, and the dead will awaken and walk the wrong land. The King of Death will come down and paint the world with blood and tears. He will become the end that speaks of destruction. After the goddess's oracle, monsters from a close continent went rampant, and necromancers became uncontrollable, causing accidents to occur all around the world. The continent's religious orders announced the oracle in order to prevent chaos and began to fight them under the blessing of a goddess to protect the world. Barros is telling Karnak there was no such oracle before he regressed, and wonders why the past keeps changing. Karnak says he's annoyed, but they don't have enough information. Barros says the rumors are totally talking about them, asking if it's related. Karnak says the time period does not line up. The oracle was from way before they regressed. Barros says this is the reason the Randolph incident moved on easily, and that surely they have to be the causes of this. Karnak says he doesn't know who the king of death is here, but he wonders if destroying the world is that easy, saying it wasn't for them. Barros says there are lots of heroes, and surely all of humanity will figure it out themselves. Karnak decides to trust in the heroes to deal with the king of death, and they should just stay here and enjoy their life in this territory. A whole week later, a man appears, introducing himself as part of the Latil Order, who serves the sun. Karnak says they're screwed. He says they found out that a necromancer active in Deer Earth City ran away here to Jestard, and they believe he is hiding in a nearby forest, so he'd like to ask for a guide who knows the way well. Barros looks over at Karnak, hoping to God he can read his thoughts, and Karnak sits down his cup, saying there's no way he could reject affairs concerning a goddess. Barros hates him, and Karnak says he'll send somebody to him quickly and then tells the guy bye. Barros barks at him, saying he thought they weren't going to intervene with worldly matters. Karnak says it's a good opportunity to get a grasp on the situation. Barros asks what he plans to do. Karnak says they'll catch the necromancer first and get rid of him, as he'll show him what true power is, straight villain. That night we see the necromancer running away, wondering if he lost all of his pursuers, and he says he thought he'd finally get to stop living like a beggar, but they immediately started chasing him, and he'll make sure to get revenge after surviving. That instantly gets cut off by a whole lot of little mini suns that are like spotlights. He says he was wondering why he was able to run so freely, realizing he fell into a trap, and they tell him they will not forgive any further commotion, and he should surrender. He begins to release his aura, asking if they really thought he'd just give up, and he screams while channeling out a wraith. The men go to pull out their protection charms, but they're too late as they immediately get bodied by the wraith. Karnak watches from a nearby tree, saying this shit is driving him insane, but it is indeed a sight to see. His words and spell techniques are all wrong, and it really makes him annoyed. Barros looks bored as hell, 
saying he thinks they should get started soon, then points over, saying look at that, he ran as soon as he started speaking, and that they should chase after. Karnak says they have to get ahead of him before they subdue him. The necromancer manages to escape into a cave, saying he spent more power than he expected, and he should hide nearby. He then decides to start a fire, but instead spots Karnak and Barros. Barros says they were so worried since he was late. Karnak says this is their usual hideout. Barros waves, asking if this is his first time as they both laugh. They then sit up as the man asks who they are. Karnak says they are people out to get him. The necromancer realizes this isn't good and calls out his wraiths, which surround Karnak. He decides to run, using them to buy time, saying they brought this upon themselves. Barros says there's quite a few, and he can't cut them with his sword, asking what they should do. Karnak tells him to stay put as he wants to test his chaos mana. Outside of the cave, the necromancer is running, saying they'll be caught up for at least a little bit. He hears a loud explosion, turning, only to see a reddish explosion from the chaos mana, and the wraiths being sent flying. Karnak asks him where he's running to, casting a spell called Concentrate and Explode. As we see him finishing the wraiths off with many little fireballs, one for each wraith. The necromancer is surprised, saying the mage is stronger than he thought, and that he's definitely going to get caught at this rate. He says he'll show them the true power of death while calling forth an evil spirit. Barros says that young ones sure do have a lot of energy, and Karnak wonders why he's calling it an evil spirit when it's just called a wraith, calling him useless. The necromancer laughs, saying he can see the fear in their faces, and Karnak asks if he is fucking blind. The necromancer says it's too late for them to beg for their lives, and launches his wraith towards them. Karnak doesn't even try to dodge, and calls out to the wraith, opening his eyes, telling it to kneel as he releases his necromancer aura. The wraith immediately bows straight to the ground and shakes in fear. The necromancer is surprised that he too is a necromancer, pretty much the Spider-Man meme. Karnak asks if he's only figuring it out now, calling him clueless. He begins to release a green aura, saying he bets he doesn't recognize this either. Using a skill called misdirection, a giant green hand appears behind the necromancer, and Karnak says this is his specialty as he clenches his fist. It wraps around the man as he screams in pain. We see him on the floor, glowing blue just like Jeppel did when Karnak asked him those questions in his sleep, and Karnak tells the man to get up, and asks him how he gained his powers. The man says it was just a stroke of luck. He was drowning his sorrows in the streets as usual, when suddenly a darkness from an alley engulfed him. An unknown power began to course through his body, and he realized it was the authority of the apocalypse, as foretold by the prophecy. With such power available for the taking, he didn't even hesitate, and using this power, he quickly grew stronger, killed everybody he disliked, and snuck into a mansion. Karnak tells him that's enough yapping, and says that he's just some random nobody. Barros asks if he plans to mind control him, saying he has his own dagger. Karnak says sure, as they need to clean things up, so he gets the man to unalive himself. Karnak stares at his corpse, saying now it's time, and he begins to take his power. Barros says he thought he was supposed to avoid dirty energy like this, and Karnak says he needs to look into it further. A search party will soon arrive, so he should just take a little to avoid suspicion. As he starts to absorb it, he realizes something is strange. Barros asks him if he's okay. Karnak shakes his head, saying that something feels really off about this. A few days later, there is a barrier. Barros asks if it's so serious that he needs to put up a soundproof barrier, and Karnak says it's not ordinary. He took a closer look at the power he collected that day. Barros asks what he found, and Karnak says that he is the cause. Barros asks how that makes sense with the timeline. Karnak says he has no idea, but its power is definitely his. Barros asks how that could be, and Karnak reminds him to think about why they picked regression over possession, as the bodies they possessed couldn't handle the spiritual power they had, and they could not find bodies that could handle it, so they abandoned their powers, separating their souls to regress back into their original bodies for a higher success rate. But he guesses his power wasn't left in the future, and he left his living body and used energy to create the form Astra Shaf, like we talked about earlier. But he made something that wasn't quite a body, nor a spirit, and he thinks his necromancy powers were bound to his spirit instead of his body. His powers crossed into the past along with his soul, but his body, unable to handle it, released all of that power. Barros is surprised that his powers also came to the past, and Karnak says that it must make sense and that all of that expelled energy became the darkness of the end. Barros sighs, saying that if the power is brought back, it's enough to end the world, and that everything is hopeless now, and maybe he should try calling it back. Karnak asks how the hell that is meant to make sense. 
Barrow starts to get really frustrated, saying that they're screwed because of him. Karnak sighs, saying the result is clear, and they won't be able to trust the world like they wanted to, as they have to step in. Barrows asks what the plan is now, while sighing. Karnak says they need to look into the darkness of the end, and Barrows says he guesses they're back to living out of sacks. Karnak says he'll make sure he's well fed. It jumps to them riding horseback, and Barrows is super happy, saying getting out here doesn't feel so bad, and maybe it's because they're not being chased, as he's enjoying the horse ride. He says there's also no signs of bandits, which is good, and Karnak says they clearly look like they have some backing, so they won't be touched, and Barrows says they did leave under the pretense of going to train, but they're only heading to Deararth City. Karnak says yes, as that's where the last necromancer they caught got his powers, so there must be clues, and Barrow says it still feels a bit unplanned, as the darkness of the end won't just walk itself to them, asking if he has some kind of ability to track it. Karnak says no, they have to do this the old-fashioned way, saying surely he remembers how they did it back in the day. Outside one of the adventurer guilds in Deararth, Karnak says this is the best place to gather information. Barrows explains how, in the past, they were able to hide their identities as adventurers, and he didn't expect to be doing it again. Karnak says it will be no different this time, as there is no need for them to become real adventurers. As they head inside to the desk, they hand the man some money, and we learn that they are asking about information related to the darkness of the end. Barros also asks why the Lord does not care when there are monsters in his territory, and Karnak says he wants to learn every detail. The man says there have been quite a few requests related to the darkness of the end, and thanks to that, they have a lot of information. He puts down a whole stack of pages, saying they can look through these first. We see the two smooth brains starting to read through it, but Barros is defeated as there is way too much information, and he is low-key illiterate. And people are just blaming it on everything. The receptionist says it looks like there is not any useful information, suggesting that they filter them out. Karnak says no, he will take all of them. Barros goes to ask if there is really a need, and then they actually start communicating using magic, bet he wished this happened when the priest came over, and Karnak says he will use this since there are a lot of people but sometimes important information is hidden among these useless looking documents. Barrow sighs, saying this is going to take way longer than he expected. A man starts to shout, asking why they don't believe him. As they both turn, we see a man saying there is an evil necromancer in town, and he quickly runs to the desk, saying he needs to file a report. The receptionist asks him if he has already talked to the temple, and the man says they won't believe him, and then they ask him to please explain the situation first. He says a while ago, a foreigner named Cleo appeared in town. As soon as he arrived, he took residence in an abandoned mansion, and he would flirt around with everybody he could. He doesn't know where he got all of his money at such a young age from, but he would hold town festivals all the time to make the people like him. He seduced all of the young women of the town with some strange skills of his. He points to a picture, saying even my fiancé Emily fell for him. Karnak and Barros look bored. Some of the men they talked to earlier ask how the fact that he is young, handsome, and rich means he is using dark powers, saying that he just sounds like a playboy. They say the dude is just overthinking all of this, and that makes him embarrassed. The receptionist then apologizes, saying he can't accept this report, and suggests that maybe he pays the fees to personally hire an adventurer. The guy is surprised by how much it is, and then runs away, saying they are going to regret not listening to him. After he leaves, some of the dudes start talking, saying that dude should have kept his jealousy in check, and there are way too many people like him today blaming everything on the darkness of the end. Karnak also says they got nothing good out of this. Barros mentions there is a good restaurant nearby, so they should head there. That's what they do. The receptionist tells them as they are leaving that he will contact them if anything changes. As soon as they leave the guild, Barros tells Karnak that Cleo does sound suspicious, wondering why he would be doing that in some hillbilly town inside of the city, and there is only one reason why he would pick innocent country girls. He is after the souls of virgins, and it must be some kind of dark magic, so they should hurry. They finally get to the town on the outskirts of the city. Karnak says that he will show him, as he uses his mana to start checking it out. He finds a barrier, saying that it is very precisely made, even a high-ranked priest would have a hard time detecting this, and the guy must be very skilled, and that he should check if it is part of the darkness of the end. He could also be a normal necromancer as well. A man starts to call out to them as we see him run over, and he is wearing priest clothes. They are both surprised, wondering what the hell he is doing out here. He introduces himself as Alias. He is the rank 1 Inquisitor of the Earth Order that serves Hatoba. Barros formally introduces Karnak as the Baron and himself as the Knight. 
Alias is surprised they are not adventurers, asking why they are here, and Karnak says he heard some strange rumors while passing by, so he just wanted to take a look. Alias laughs, then asks if they could do some favors for him, saying it is all for the goddess and he won't make them do anything weird. Karnak is blinded by how bright this golden retriever energy is, though he is still not on Barros's level. Alias says he is not certain yet, but there is a possibility that a necromancer is hiding in this town. Karnak and Barros are both surprised that the Order knows, asking why he came alone then. Alias sighs, saying that the Order won't do anything unless there is concrete evidence, and they don't believe there is a necromancer here since there is so much false information. Karnak says this is a suspicious situation though. Alias says it is a relative issue after all, as it is not hard to be considered rich and handsome in a countryside town like this compared to the city. That's why he was trying to take care of it on his own. Alias starts to look at Barros, saying that his sword and armor look well used, and his body is well trained as well, so someone like him cannot be weak, and he starts to tell them that they both look very skilled, so he is sure they will be of great help. Even though Alias is really bright, they want nothing to do with him. Karnak says it is annoying, but he guesses they can accompany him for a while since they need to check some things out. Barros asks what he will do if he figures out that Karnak is a necromancer. Karnak says they will just men and black him by getting rid of his memories. Barros calls him evil, saying they should avoid that as he is yet to see someone stay sane after going through that. Karnak then tells Alias that they will help him, and Alias gets super excited, saying he will take them to the church first as we see them heading through the town. They finally make their way to the church, and the town church head named Graz and the nun Julia greet him. Graz says that Mr. Cleo is of great help to the town, and he is definitely not related to necromancy, and that a priest stopped by before but left after just a few minutes, so they came for nothing. Alias says it is okay, as it is a good thing that there is nothing here because that means that nobody is in danger, and that would be a big relief. Graz says that that is true, and they cannot offer him much, but they should make themselves comfortable, and he will guide them to their rooms. At Cleo's estate, we see a barrier, and his butler is saying that another person from the order has come to investigate, and Cleo says to report it to him as soon as he notices something. After the boys get into the room, Karnak says that even they have very positive opinions of Cleo, and perhaps the entire town has been deceived. Alias says yes, and it will be pointless to interrogate people about him. Karnak is surprised that he wants to go to his mansion, asking if he is going to interrogate him. Alias laughs, saying that there is a more effective method than that, and that both he and Barros just need to go along with his plan. Back at Cleo's mansion, we see him walking down the hallway when one of his servants notices him, and she asks him what he's doing so late at night. He says he's on his way to greet an unwanted guest, and that she should go and rest. She says okay, and she'll see him tomorrow, and Cleo says that he didn't think charms would work this well, and he can't believe how weak the human mind is, as we see he is actually way older than he looks on the outside. As we see, he is faking his face. He says it took almost half a year to prepare everything to summon the demon, and it's about time for his efforts to bear fruit, yet another hindrance appears. He says he's glad he placed the detection barrier, and he'll just talk to them for a bit and send them back. He opens the door, saying he found them, asking what they are doing here. As we see them straight robbing him, Barros says they didn't expect to get caught, asking if he's the rumored young master from this estate, and they heard that he's been giving out money to townspeople, asking maybe they could get some as well. Cleo sighs, saying he can't believe there are thieves here, and he was worried for no reason. Barros and Karnak ask why he's laughing, saying it looks like he needs to be taught a lesson. Cleo begins to use a green magic, saying that they are unworthy of becoming sacrifices. Alias comes in clutch, using a spell from Hatoba to block the attack, Barros says it's just as Karnak said, and he didn't think he would be revealed this easily. Alias says this is a method that has already been proven. Cleo realizes he was too complacent, and he has no choice but to get rid of them all here. He begins to summon the undead, telling them to take care of the intruders as we see a group running towards the boys. Alias says he'll buy the two of them time with his authority, and they say alright, though I doubt they need it as Barros runs straight in, taking care of each and every one of the undead on his side. Karnak also starts to cast a bunch of magic arrows with his chaos mana as they fly in, killing the undead on his side. Cleo says it's a little too early, but he has no choice, calling forth a beast from the underworld. From his green portal, we see a red aura instantly fly out, crashing into the ground as he summoned a demon knight. Cleo laughs, asking them if they think they can handle this, and on cue, Alias stabs his staff into the ground, calling forth the light of Hatoba to cleanse the evil, using a spell called Holy Dispel. A bright yellow light passes through them all, 
and Cleo asks if this is meant to be a countersummon. The demon knight starts to scream, saying he can't disappear like this as he gets sucked into the bright abyss, disappearing from the spot, and Alias says he already knew what spell he would try to use. Cleo says he acknowledges the three of them, and they aren't just some ragtag group, and it seems like he no longer needs to hide his true form. He begins to hulk out, growing tremendously as his clothes begin to rip, and he lets out a scream as his aura pushes throughout the room. We see that he has grown almost triple the size, and he lets out a scream. Alias says he didn't think this would happen, and he doesn't have time to cast another counter summon. He goes to tell Karnak and Barros to be careful, but they are already leaping past him as Barros comes in from the top rope with multiple slashes all over Cleo. Karnak follows up with magic arrows that pierce him straight in the chest, and he is instantly defeated within the span of a few seconds. Alias says that their strength is ordinary, but their teamwork and skills are incredible. Barros asks Alias if they should kill him or let him be, and Alias says he'll take care of him as he begins to cast some kind of spell on Cleo's cuts with his staff. As Karnak's original mana, the darkness of the end, begins to flow out of Cleo's wounds, Alias says that it's just as expected, and he wonders if he has to clean up this hallway as well. But Alias catches a does this rag smell funny no jutsu, and Karnak says it's time for them to get started as well, as we see him absorbing the energy from the end. Barros asks if there's anything interesting. Karnak says it looks like Cleo has always been a necromancer, and he just happened to take the chance to absorb some of the darkness of the end. Barros says it's tempting since it's great power, asking if there's anything else. Karnak says it seems like Cleo was also a cult member that reveres Tesrainik. Barros asks who Tesrainik is, and Karnak says he seems to be considered the god of death. Barros finds that surprising, saying that he thought Karnak was the god of death. Not anybody can claim a title like that. Karnak says he's actually not too sure either. According to the Gospel of the Cult, Tesrainik is the god of death and rebirth. He's considered to be an entity that will purify the world through death and create a new paradise. Barros says that with the cultists and with that god, there must be a reason for all of this, especially for them believing in a god that does not exist. And Karnak says he's probably right as that's all the useful information there is. Karnak says he also gained one more thing as well. With the power of a priest, he can easily refine Chaos Mana. Barros asks if this is the reason why he wanted to come with the priest to test this out. Karnak says yes, since Chaos Mana is purified necromancer energy, if he can use divinity, he thought he could easily purify more Chaos Mana. Barros says that's the reason he wanted help experimenting with divinity, and it was interesting to watch. Karnak gives the vial to Alias, saying with this his mana should have doubled, and he should be around a fourth circle magician. Barros says it looks like they'll need to be on the lookout for holy artifacts. Karnak says they could also just steal some from the church, and they should wake up Alias now. They do that, asking Alias if he's okay. It umps to later as Alias is surprised he didn't expect to fall for a trap like that. He can't believe he let his guard down. He was completely convinced by their acting. Karnak says it looks like everything ended well, and the townspeople seem confused. Alias says with the help of the church, he's sure they'll calm down, asking where they plan to go now. Karnak says he plans to rest in Dirarth city. Alias says this is goodbye then and gives them a blessing as they leave, and Barros tells him to be careful on his way back as well. Alias thinks about it, saying there's something suspicious about them, and he'll need to return and learn more about them in the future. On the outskirts of Dirarth city, we hear a man with a muffled voice as Karnak says to raise him. A man gets pulled out of some water, saying that he is a necromancer, and he'll tell them everything about the power of darkness, asking them what they want to know. Karnak tells Barros to dunk him once more. Karnak laughs, saying all the bad energy is flowing out, and nothing extracts it better than holy water. Barros asks if they should pour more, and Karnak says yes. We see him stretching on his way back to their inn, and he says they got a lot today, and Hatoba is getting them the good stuff, and things are working out really well. Barros says he'll contact the order to clean the mess up, and they caught quite a few necromancers, and he was surprised when Alias asked for their assistance. Karnak says that's just how much they needed help, and they probably investigated them after the Cleo incident. The only thing they'll find is that he lost his family to necromancers, and naturally, they'll think of him as the most likely person to be hunting necromancers. They can bring them important cases for free and give tons of holy relics, so he can't complain. Barros says it's about time they head back though, but Karnak says not yet. Barros sighs, asking if he's planning to collect every single scattered piece. Karnak says of course not, he's just blocking the pathways through which it spreads. Looking into it, the power is spread through gates in time, and he's investigating the conditions for those gates to appear. 
Barrow says that'll take at least three more months, and maybe some massive event will happen. As soon as he says that, a letter falls out from the door, and they pick it up, wondering what it is. Karnak reads it out, saying that Alias wants to see them, and he'll explain it in person. Barrow says he can smell something cooking up. They jump to the Hatoba temple as Alias is welcoming them in. Alias introduces his two companions to Karnak and Barrows, calling Karnak a baron and Barrows's knight, one of them, a six-circle mage named Real Thine, introduces himself, and another one named Sarati Allen, a swordsman from the Adventurer's Guild. Karnak says this must be Sarati, the Ori user who awakened her material energy at the age of 20, and she's quite famous these days. Barrows says yes, and even the man called Real Thine is an advanced mage too. Mages and martial energy users are sorted into levels depending on their power. The more circles a mage has, the more advanced spells they can use. A grand mage of the tenth circle becomes a being that transcends the limits of humanity. Karnak says he's actually reached the stage of grand mage, he just lacks mana. An aura user awakened to martial energy is, in essence, the same, red, blue, purple, silver, and then gold knights, the higher you go, the purer and stronger your aura gets, and among them, Becoming a Gold Knight is a stage only obtained by the 4th Martial King. Real Thine is a 6 circle mage, and Sarati is a Red Knight, so they will be good as backup. Karnak asks Barros if he ever learned martial energy, and Barros says no, but he fought the 4th Martial King evenly, asking why he's bringing up old wounds. Karnak stretches his hand out, saying he's heard much about them, and it's an honor to meet them. They say there's no need to be honored, asking how they caught so many necromancers in such a short time. Karnak is clueless. Alias laughs, saying now that they've greeted each other, he would like to begin the explanation. They sit down at a table, and Alias says, as they can tell by the people that have gathered, there is something coming. Recently, their order was involved in a problem in Trist City, and it has been causing trouble ever since. Trist City is located between the Kingdom of Eustil and the Kingdom of Tarlem. It is a city that has long had quarrels over its land. The kingdoms grew tired of quarreling and sent one of each's nobility to be married and created the Count family of Trist to rule over the neutral land. However, the problem is that this city is located in a place that is suitable for trade, and they lack the authority to properly rule over the growing wealth and number of people, which leads to crime syndicates trying to take control of it. Thus, Trist was turned into ruins by continued crime, and the largest crime syndicates, the Renfells and the Pulfs, expanded their power. The two clans claim the heritage of Trist's bloodline and split the city but have still been fighting to figure out the true successor. The kingdom, which had been troubled by the management of the city, agreed to give the city a new count. The Renfells and Pulfs continued to fight for decades, but the Pulfs gained the upper hand ever since the darkness of the end took hold. The Pulfs, who were involved in the slave trade business, worked with necromancers who had similar goals, and they quickly began to attack the Renfells, but they bit off more than they could chew as the Renfells reported their crimes to the Order, and the Order made a move as soon as they confirmed the use of necromancy. The fight ended in the victory of the Renfells, and the Pulfs were barely able to maintain their name. Karnak says it seems like it was all resolved, and Alias says that the problem is the Renfells are also being accused of using necromancers, just that unlike the Pulfs, they hide it very well. Sarati says that means both of them are the same, asking how the Order was not aware of this. It's hard to tell due to the tracks that the darkness of the end has left. Sarati starts to get angry, saying that just means they can claim it wasn't them, and these people are unforgivable. Barrow says this sounds really familiar, and Karnak starts barking too, saying that those people are creatures who have given up on being human, calling them unforgivable. Barrow says he has no shame and then says that the Hatoba Order's reputation is at stake, so it must be done discreetly. Alia says that's right, and they need to be careful. If they mess it up or get into trouble, it'll be bad. They should disguise themselves and infiltrate the city. They then ask Alias why he has no other order members to do this. He says he is ashamed to admit it, but they are leaking information from within the order. The previous group they sent to the Renfells disappeared without a trace, and they were all skilled adventurers. They suspect it was the doing of Bishop Strath. He is a high-ranking priest who assisted the Renfells in driving out the Pulfs. Karnak asks if that means he hasn't informed the rest of the order about this plan. He says yes as he's doing this on his own accord, and he has enough authority to do it. So he intends to report it once it's done. And they need definite proof of necromancy being used. Sarati says that could be dangerous, and the whole city could turn against him. He says that's why he's called them here today, and he believes in each and every one of them, as they will be able to fend for themselves in even the worst case scenario.
it jumps to the Renfell Manor in an underground chamber as we hear some people being tortured, and we see some even being tied up. A man says it's been a while since the order sent them. They think it's time for them to make a move again. And we hear a man say if that's the case, he'll welcome them, as they're all sending more sacrifices his way, and it is none other than Bishop Strath. He snaps his fingers as the green necromancer magic begins to kill all of the prisoners, and he begins to collect their essence. The man says that's quite a lot, asking if his body can handle it. Strath says of course not. And that is why he must do this. As we see him using Hatoba's energy to keep it at bay, he says that he protects his body with the grace of the great goddess, and he hopes they will send some formidable adventurers this time. That way, he can benefit even more. As we see, Alias and the group have now arrived at Trist City, and this place is run down. They all look around, saying this place looks horrible, but we learn that it's due to the super high crime rate that it looks like this. Alias tells them to hold on to their belongings, and as soon as he says that, a knife comes flying past them, hitting real Thine's bag. As his gold begins to fall out, we see a bunch of children run by, stealing it all, and they start to get away with it. Real Thine starts to cast magic while yelling at them, and Alias says this place is every man for themselves, and it's called the City of Sin for a reason. Real Thine sighs, putting away his magic, asking how they can trust staying the night in a place like this. And Alias says he knows of a place. We see Sarati and the rest are all asking if he really wants them to stay here as he is getting them to lodge at the Plos Manor, and Alias says exactly. They wonder if he's gone crazy. Inside, we hear a woman saying that she has no intention to make excuses. All those who have dipped their hands in banned magic should have been punished, and that includes her father. But that the Renfells have also broken the law, and they can't let them get away with it. She is the head of the Plof household, called Sildura. Alias says he agrees, and they cannot just watch the Trist Parish commit all these acts of violence. Karnak and Barrows find him scary, saying that he's instantly redirected it towards Trist. Alias says since they agree on this matter, he would appreciate her help regarding the operation against Renfell. Sildura says she'll do her best, asking what his plan is, since they have reinforced the security recently, and it's impossible to approach the mansion unless you're someone who is highly ranked. Alias says that's exactly why he plans to just ambush the Renfell residents instead. Everybody is completely confused. Real Thine says that's a bit too simple of a plan, but Alias says it's bound to work. Sildura tells him they don't have much of a military force, so it is doable. But they also don't have any information on the necromancers, asking if it'll be okay. Alias says that's fine, as these people are veterans when it comes to fighting necromancers. That is why he has the four of them, after all. That night at the Renfell estate, we see everybody on guard duty as the group all got their shisties on. We hear someone, who is actually not one of the boys, as they throw some molotovs over the walls, saying this is all for the sake of revenge. The Molotovs explode, trapping the guards, and they wonder what's going on, but they understand that it's an ambush. We see the actual group using this distraction as a chance to sneak past the guards. Karnak says that was actually pretty useful, and Alias says they should make the best of this opportunity, as he can smell the stink of a necromancer. As soon as they get inside, we see armored knights asking if the plof sent them. Real Thine says he would like to greet these elite knights right off the bat, casting a fireball, causing them to disperse. He then follows it with chain lightning, which is actually chain lightning for the first time I think in any manhwa I have read. As we see it wrap around the knights, one of the men says not to panic as there are only five of them. From the top rope comes Sarati, as she's imbuing her sword with aura. She swings, shooting out an aura blade, and they wonder what the hell an aura user is doing here. While they're distracted, she lands on her feet and starts making easy work of the crowd by charging forward, slicing quite a few of their throats. Barros watches this, saying that's not how she's meant to do it, and that her movements are actually disappointing him. Karnak says that's rich, coming from somebody who doesn't have battle aura. A knight then tells them to die as he starts to attack them, but Barros says he'll handle this and calls them light work as he easily swings his blade, dispatching two of them. Karnak shoots more magic arrows, saying they should continue further as he takes out two more in an instant. Another knight falls beside them as Alias is beating them with pure brute force, swinging his sword around wildly. I take back what I said about golden retriever energy, this dude is a straight chihuahua. The knights begin to run away, and Alias says it looks like that's all there was. Sarati asks why the necromancers haven't come out yet. Alias assumes they are waiting inside the building, as it would be more advantageous for them to fight in there, after all. They head deeper inside to the foyer, saying that it's really quiet, and we hear a voice greeting them, saying that they've made it all the way in here, 
and that the Ori user and high rank mage must be pretty famous, but it is all pointless in the face of the darkness of the end, and they begin to laugh. Everybody's immediately happy, as they finally found the evidence they were looking for. Sarati says they just need to capture them and go back, and Elias says yes, there should be more than enough evidence. Whereas Karnak and Barros have more sinister plots, and they say that these three are going to be some good money. The necromancer asks how dare they laugh, sending out a specter, saying he would like to see them laugh at this, telling it to absorb their life essence. As it gets close, Alias stretches his hand out, saying that the light of the goddess shall punish all that is impure. The specter freezes up, and the necromancers are caught off guard that there is a priest. Sarati takes this chance to dash in, cutting the specter's head off while screaming. She doesn't stop there, she instantly runs to the necromancers. She rears her blade back and goes to attack, but it's too late as their heads explode. Alia says he told her they had to capture them, and she quickly says that was not her. As the mansion slowly begins to warp into a hellish nightmare scape, we hear a familiar voice laughing, saying this is a nice harvest. He didn't expect all of these high-grade materials to come here, and even Inquisitor Alias. Alias recognizes him, saying that he is certain that that is none other than Strath, and Strath says indeed, and that surely he came here because he suspected him in the first place. Alias says that he didn't want to believe that a servant of the goddess would be tempted by the power of the dark. We see Realthine and Sarati trying to attack the walls, but the attacks don't do anything. Alias says it must be because their powers are weakened by the darkness, and he will try to eliminate the energy. As he begins to release his magic, he quickly realizes it's futile as his divinity is not working here. Karnak is surprised, saying that the divine power is actually fueling the necromancer. Strath starts to laugh, asking if he thinks that the people he came across until now were the real necromancers, and says that's not the case at all. If that was all there was to necromancy, why would the Seven Orders be so wary of the power in the first place? He asks Alias how it feels to have met a real necromancer. Karnak tells Barrows to get ready, saying that if they are unlucky, they might actually die here. Karnak explains that the barrier is mixed with divine power and necromancy as well, and he's never seen a barrier like this. There isn't anything they can do, and he has to actually use his necromancy power. Barros finds it surprising that Karnak doesn't know the spell, asking how some hillbilly town priest can pull it off while even the god of death can't. Strath says there is nowhere to run. As we see things being formed out of the walls, Alias recognizes it, saying that it's a necromancy puppet called the Chaotic Golem, as they are surrounded. As the golems start to charge in, Alias puts up a barrier using his divinity. The barrier immediately begins to crack, and he says that he can't hold it much longer. Realthine tells him to do so as long as he can, because he's planning something. As Realthine starts channeling a fireball on his staff, he shoots it out, but it doesn't matter as he and Alias both instantly get sent flying backward and lay unconscious underneath two golems. The golems pick them up, and Strath tells them to take them to the basement with the other offerings. Sarati starts fighting back, and she attacks one of the golems but instantly realizes her attack did not do anything. Then it grabs a hold of her, Strath tells the golem to take her to the basement, as the other two are useless. Both Karnak and Barrow stare at each other, wondering if he means them. Strath says that she has such a desirable soul, and begins to squeeze her. But Barrows comes in, cutting the golem's arm off, saying he told her to be careful. He raises his blade, piercing the golem directly in the chest, breaking it into two pieces. Sarati did not expect this at all, and asks how he's doing that without using aura. Barros tries to think about how to explain it and says that the weak points of these golems are the spots where mana does not flow. The issue is that the flow keeps shifting, making it tough to pinpoint each one. He says that she's on her own for now, and if he runs out of stamina, he'll be finished, and that surely Karnak should be stepping in by now. Karnak realizes that this is bad, as his necromancy is not working on it either. Even if he tries to imbue the fog with his own power, he still can't control it, and at this rate, they are going to lose, so he needs another solution. He holds back the golems with his necromancy powers, saying that he can't believe there are spells he didn't know about, and there has to be something else involved in this. He only has one idea as to what that could be, and decides that it's time to test his theory. A little mythbuster action. While Barros is fighting, saying that these golems are hella annoying, Karnak is doing his part as well, keeping them at bay. Strath gets annoyed, asking how his golems are being destroyed so easily, and he should not have underestimated them. He should have absorbed the scroll sealed in the Hatoba order as well. As the golems aren't enough, Strath realizes he'll definitely need to step it up here. As something flies by Karnak and Barros, we see a ghostly appearance, and they yell to Sarati to get over here. 
she realizes how far she is, and begins to run away from the spirit. Karnak says that she's slower than he expected. She manages to block it with her blade, and tries swinging at it, but it only goes through it. The spirit's attack pierces through her arms, instantly disabling them, causing her to scream in pain. It grabs onto her, and Karnak says that's enough, calling Strath an amateur necromancer. Karnak says that he guesses he was right. Strath starts to panic, wondering what's going on, as his barrier is collapsing, and he asks Karnak what he did. Karnak says nothing much, he just placed his own barrier on top of his, and Strath should stop acting so high and mighty when he's just an amateur. Strath says that he hates being looked down on, and begins to summon undead. As they get close to Karnak, Barros asks how Strath can summon them when the barrier is gone, and Karnak says Strath can't do much against this type of basic necromancy, and they'll need to handle it themselves. But Barros says that they all look like high-ranked undead, asking why Karnak called it basic. It seems like Strath has more necromancy power than they thought, and they'll be fighting forever at this rate. Karnak says the longer they fight, the worse it'll get for them, so they need to make a break for it when they get the chance. He casts out an ability called Dark Blade that pushes all of the undead back, giving them enough space to actually be able to work with it. Strath says this isn't bad, but it's useless against his overwhelming power, and calls forth the Demon of Gehenna. It begins to appear from the ground out of a magic circle, and begins to laugh, telling the contractor to state his desires. Strath says he needs to kill those men and bring him the woman. The demon looks down, asking who exactly he's meant to kill, as we see Karnak and Barros both are translucent. Karnak says he's never seen a necromancer fall for an illusion so easily. Ever since Strath's barrier broke, it's only proven that this dude is an amateur, and then he leaves. Strath is confused, asking how this was all an illusion. He starts to get pissed, calling them bastards. On the outside, Karnak clicks his tongue, asking what kind of dude would fall for that, saying Strath focused on only one thing, and he tunneled really bad. Barros says it gave them enough time to escape, and it'd be dangerous to go back to the pulse right now. Karnak agrees, saying the Renfells will search there first. Sarati calls Karnak out on lying to them all, and they both wonder how they're going to spin this to her. They ask her how she's feeling, and she says not to pretend like they care, calling them filthy necromancers. Karnak says they're hiding on the outskirts of the city to avoid the barriers, as they needed time to heal her. She asks why they would heal her and not kill her. Karnak says they're trying to be good people, and they'll erase her memories. She says it's fine, she can't feel her hands anymore, so she won't be able to live like a swordsman, so she would rather he just kill her right here and right now. Barros's eyes actually show concern as he himself is a swordsman, and he asks Karnak why they don't try using a healing spell from a skilled priest. Karnak says they can't use holy magic as it would go against the natural order. Barros asks if that's really the case, and if there's nothing they can do with necromancy. Karnak tries to get him to stop speaking, but Sarati speaks up, asking if he can use necromancy to give her back her arms. He says that he might be able to, but he doesn't recommend it. In order to accept the necromancer's power, she would have to become his servant, asking her if she would really be able to be the servant of an evil necromancer. She seems really scared about it and explains that a necromancer can control the human soul to use them like slaves through a slave contract. There have been plenty of stories of captured adventurers going through cruel torture until they met their end. She says that it's too terrible, and she does not want to accept that, but she looks down at her hands and starts to really think about it. Karnak stares at her and tells Barros he did this on purpose. Barros laughs, asking if it was that obvious, saying he had no choice, and he knows what she's feeling right now. Karnak says that although he is trying to stay away from using necromancy, seeing her in her current state, he doesn't really have a suggestion as to what to do. If she becomes his servant, she will regain her arms, and she can decide, and he'll do whatever she wants. She asks what will happen if she does become his servant, and he says once the contract has been sealed, he'll see the structure of her soul, and with that information, he'll restore her body. After that, she will have free will, but a few restrictions will be placed. If she betrays him, she will be faced with death. She thinks about it, saying it sounds dangerous, but it's not too different from the vow of loyalty that knights undergo. He asks if she'd rather lose her freedom or her future as a swordsman. We see exactly what she's on, as she calls out to Karnak, telling him to please accept her as a servant. He double-checks, asking her if she's really sure about this, and she says yes, it's better than never being able to pick the sword up again. He says okay, and he'll start. Karnak begins to cast the oath, asking her if she accepts, and she says she does. He tells her to open her mind and accept the contract of servitude, 
and if she does so, she will regain what she has lost. Some purple texts begin to appear on her body as they make their way to her hands, knocking away all the impurities and restoring the color to them. She looks down at her hands and can actually move them again. Karnak says with this, she is now his servant, and she's really excited, calling him master. Barros says that's good, and from now on, they need to figure out what they can do about Alias and Realthine. Karnak says that Strath's necromancy is stronger than he expected, so they had better use large-scale necromancy instead of chaos mana. Barros says that would be bad because it would destroy the city. Karnak says that's why they have two choices. First, they get ready, and then go save Alias and Realthine, or second, they give up and run away. Barros says, bro, both of these choices are straight ass, and it makes them seem like the bad guys. While they think about it more, Barros and Karnak both agree that being a good guy is hard. Sarati says that saving your friends is the obvious choice. Barros asks if she still agrees, even though they'd have to use violent methods. She says even if it's not the best choice, they can't give up on the rest, and saving your friends despite the potential danger is the right thing to do. Barros says he sees that if the investment is good, even evil methods are justified. They are taking notes for their good guy class. They both get really excited, and Karnak says he guesses he has no choice but to use necromancy then. Barros says exactly, Sarati said it would be justified. She tries to tell them that that's not what she said. In the town, we see a bunch of Strath's men banging on the doors, asking if they've seen outsiders, telling everybody to come out. Some of the citizens ask what they're doing, and the man tells them to shut up, they've just been given an order to catch outsiders. One of the men begins to drink, asking why they're doing this shit so late at night, and another one turns, asking what he thinks he's doing here. The drinking man clicks his tongue, saying he can't order him around. As they begin to argue, the man's sword begins to glow with a green aura, and he attacks the drinking man, who asks if he's trying to pick a fight. He tells him it's a misunderstanding as his sword moves on its own, but the drinking man retaliates, cutting the man across the chest. Some of his co-workers tell him to stop, and they should get back to work, but when the drinking man turns around, we see his eyes are red, and his teeth have gotten very sharp, and he says that he's the one who started it first. They all see him as a monster and charge in to kill him. He asks them to wait, wondering what they were talking about, and they do exactly that by gutting him. Karnak says this city is so corrupt, everybody falls into panic as soon as something happens. Sarati asks why he has to cause such a scene, and he says he's making an undead army. She asks if he's doing that right here, and he says it's the best choice to fight against Strath, and there's enough death energy here to do it. However, there weren't enough bodies to control, so he had no choice. If there aren't enough, he needs to make them. Barrow starts to laugh, saying although it's evil, it's all to save their friends. Karnak begins to laugh as well. Sarati wonders if this is okay, saying if she hadn't said anything in the first place, they would have just left. She thinks Karnak doesn't seem nearly as evil as the rumors say, as he's only targeting members of Renfell, leaving the citizens out of it. As the Renfell members are attacking each other, we see one get his arm cut open, and he screams. But it's not just happening to them, as each and every one of these group members are slaughtering each other. Karnak says with this, there should be more than enough to make things even, and he stretches his hand out as a purple aura begins to release from it, and he says it's time to awaken his army. All of the corpses begin to have a purple aura around them as they soon rise. The undead begin to sit up and listen to Karnak's command as they walk forward. Sarati says never mind, he's just as cruel and evil as she expected, as he now has an entire army of undead under his grasp, and he tells them to march forward. She wonders if becoming his servant was actually the right call. As soon as they get into the mansion, we see some weird mud golem creatures jump down from the trees and ambush the army. Karnak says everything is going according to plan, and Strath's necromancy power is stronger than he thought, as he has managed to summon a death dragon and seven trumpeteers. Karnak says he should be the only one capable of using that spell, and since the past changed, maybe other people have obtained some of his items. He decides to go, as they'll be found out like this. Sarati asks what will get found out. Karnak says the fact that the zombies are illusions. She's surprised, and he says most of them are, asking if she really thought he would be able to make all of them in that short period of time. It's not that he can't, though. She starts to immediately forget him being evil and says he's nice again, saying that they should hurry along. Back inside the manor, Strath is preparing to sacrifice Realthine and Alias. He says these mere zombies are nothing but pests, despite their numbers. He starts to look through all of his soldiers, wondering where they are, as he's doing his very best to figure out where Karnak is. 
But on cue, Karnak says this is pretty big, surprised that there was a basement underneath the estate like this. Strath is surprised and turns to see Karnak behind him, and Karnak says he already told him he'd come back soon. Strath asks how the hell they got in here, as Karnak is telling Strath that he seems tired, and the zombies must have taken a toll on him. Sarati notices Alias and Realthine laying down and is glad that they have not been sacrificed yet. Strath gets pissed, realizing this is all Karnak's doing, and says that Karnak seems to be mistaken about something. Although he is tired, it's not enough that he can't face bastards like him, and he'll make Karnak regret crawling in here. As he sends forward his undead army, Karnak and Sarati both quickly leave Karnak's side to deal with the group. Karnak stretches his hand out, releasing his green magic, saying, Come, slaves of the soul, I call you from the depths of purgatory, echoes of the underworld, as his own wraiths have now been summoned to join the fight. One wraith is able to take out at least two of the zombies, and they are making light work of Strath's army, as are Sarati and Barros. As Strath's zombie army falls to the floor, one by one, eventually they're all eliminated. Strath asks how the hell Karnak dealt with them so quickly, saying that now he'll use his trump card, and he summons the Gehenna demon once more, as it comes from the floor. Barros asks if Strath isn't tired of doing the same thing over and over, and we learn that the demon is named Magnan. Karnak says this is too repetitive, and that Strath's power must have reached a limit by now. Karnak's magic begins to wrap around the bottom of Magnan, which startles him, and he asks what's going on. As Magnan begins to get pulled back in, Karnak says it's called countersummoning, telling him he should go back to where he came from. Magnan says he can just rip it to shreds, and something like this is insignificant in the face of his power, as he destroys the floor beneath him, finally stepping out, and he asks Strath to say what he wants. Strath is surprised it worked, but tells Magnan the same order, he wants the men dead and the woman brought to him. Magnan says that he will fulfill the contract as he begins to release a powerful pressure throughout the room. Sarati is surprised by the pressure, and Karnak wonders why the gate stopped closing. Since it didn't go as planned, he tells the two of them to go forward and fight. Sarati goes for Magnan's head, while Barros just runs in, but Magnan easily blocks both of their attacks, calling them laughable as he raises his sword for a follow-up. He swings where they were standing, but they backpedal out of the way, creating distance. The shockwave is still strong enough to make them have to go even further away, and Karnak asks, what about this? As he begins to cast a fireball, he shoots three directly towards Magnan, who stretches his hand out, blocking the attacks, not even scathing him. Sarati says if Magnan was an aura user, he would be around the level of a purple knight. Barrow sighs, saying if only he had awakened his battle aura, he wouldn't be struggling like this. That makes Karnak think of something, and he tells Barrows to go with plan P. Barrows is surprised that he forgot about that, and Sarati asks what it is. Karnak begins to release his blue aura this time and calls Barrows his kin. Sarati is confused, saying that she doesn't think they're related, but Karnak says to open her mind and accept it, as this is her master's order. As his eyes glow blue, so do Sarati's, and Plan P stands for possession, as Barros is now in her body. Saying it's been a while since he inhabited someone else's, Barros realizes by kin Karnak meant his servant. Karnak gives them a nickname, saying, Go forward, Sarah Barros. Sarati calls it a stupid name, and Barros apologizes for using her body, and she begins to cry, saying to treat her well when he gives it back. Magnan laughs, asking how a bastard who isn't an aura user is supposed to use someone else's aura. But Barros instantly does exactly that, asking why Magnan thought he wouldn't be able to. Magnan asks how, but he's too slow to react to the attack, as he gets cut across the stomach. Barros says using someone else's aura is actually his expertise. Magnan realizes that Barros is much stronger than before, and that this is going to be difficult. Her aura goes from red to blue, and she's surprised that she became a blue knight, all because Barros is using her body. Barros says that her latent power is incredible, and thanks to that, he'll be able to fight a bit more comfortably. He leaps back in, trading blow for blow with Magnan, cutting him all over while smiling, as he's enjoying every minute of it. But Magnan is stressed, saying there's no way he would be losing this. Barros quickly runs up the side of Magnan's arm. When Magnan goes to swing at him, Barros instantly drops to the ground and laughs, asking if this is really all Magnan has. Magnan is gassed out, calling Barros a monster, asking if he thought he had won though. He shoots out a powerful magic attack, saying once the possession is over, Barros will lose, as the attack goes toward Karnak. We see a purple explosion from where Karnak was standing, and Magnan starts to laugh, calling Karnak careless. 
But Karnak asks what Magnan was doing, saying he didn't expect the same trick to work multiple times, and that they sure are stupid, asking if Magnan really thought he wouldn't have been able to tell what he was thinking. Magnan gets overwhelmed as there are too many Karnaks due to the illusions, and he doesn't know who to kill. While his focus is diverted, Barros quickly comes with some surprise backshots, wounding Magnan even more. Magnan realizes he's overexerted himself to get out of the countersummon, and now he has no mana left, and he can't believe that a mere human could do this to him. A portal begins to appear at his feet, and they realize that he's leaving. Magnan tells them to wait, saying that he's leaving for now, but once he gets back, he will find them first, and then he'll make sure to take them back to hell with him. Karnak is surprised, asking if Magnan is really trying to run after everything they've done, and if they'd even let him go in the first place. Karnak stretches his hand out, telling Magnan to become extinct, as a purple aura leaves his hand, wrapping around Magnan just like it did when he fought Randolph. Magnan screams, saying that his mana is flowing backward. His face slowly starts to warp as his body gets constricted, squeezing it on itself until it gets thinner and thinner, disappearing into the air. All of Karnak's illusions then dissipate, and the possession has ended. Sarati wonders why her body hurts so much. Barros thanks her for letting him use it, saying that once she releases her aura, it will hurt less. Karnak says now there is only one more bastard to deal with. Strath sighs and says that he surrenders, and he will tell Karnak all the information he knows, asking what he wants. Karnak says that he thinks there is a misunderstanding here. Strath asks what it is. Karnak says it is simpler to kill him, and interrogate his soul. As it's unnecessary to make things more complicated. Karnak asks Sarati if there's any reason why he shouldn't kill Strath. Sarati says nope, go ahead and kill him. As Karnak uses his misdirection magic, a giant scythe forms above Strath. Strath tries to run away, screaming wait. As the scythe starts to swing, but it eventually impales him, ending his life. Karnak runs over to Strath's body and says, okay, it's time for business, as he extracts a little green ball from the corpse, saying that it was very generous and is around 30 servings. Barros is happy, saying finally they will be able to go home. Karnak agrees, saying with this much, it's more than enough to return. Barros says he will find some restaurants on their way back home. Sarati calls out to them, saying they can't just leave Alias and Realthine here. Karnak says he actually forgot about them. It jumps to Alias screaming, what? As we see that he is surprised the three of them defeated Strath all by themselves. Realthine says Strath is not someone that three people can just beat. Karnak says they were lucky. He explains that a while after Alias and Realthine were injured by golems and dragged down here, a sudden army of zombies attacked the residents, possibly sent by some other necromancer using the commotion to rise and revolt. If you think about Strath's character, it makes sense. He must have been so low on necromancy power that he ran into the basement. Karnak says they didn't miss the opportunity and got Sarati's help to defeat him. She goes along with the story. Alias is relieved, saying it must have been Hatoba's blessing. Karnak says they didn't touch the corpse, so please carry on the purification ritual. Alias touches Strath's corpse with his staff, collecting the darkness of the end, saying this is ten times the amount they have collected thus far. Barros is confused, asking Karnak why there is still some left. Karnak says it would have been too obvious if he took all of it. Alias says he thinks they are done now, and since they defeated Strath, Renfell has now lost their primary force, so the city will soon stabilize, and they can leave the rest of the work to the Order. It jumps to later as Alias is screaming, what? Again, as he has now learned that Sarati has become a Knight of the Gestured Barony, and he asks her why. Karnak wonders why it is so surprising, and Sarati says she realized from last night's events that Baron Karnak is someone worth pledging her allegiance to, though she is a horrible actor. Alias says that since she has found someone to serve, that is a good thing. Karnak says he will return to the territory to officially ordain her. He and Alias shake hands as Karnak thanks him for his cooperation. Karnak says when the opportunity arises, they will see each other again. It jumps to the gestured estate as Japella is greeting them, and he is super excited. Karnak says he is glad to see them all again. Jeppel asks how they have been, and he spots Sarati in the back, wondering who this beautiful woman is. He starts to think about the fact that maybe Karnak has brought himself a lady home, but Karnak corrects the misunderstanding, saying that she is going to be a new knight, and she greets them all. Jeppel says that even if the territory is on the edge, they can't just take anyone in as a knight. Barros tells Sarati to show them her skills, and she draws her blade, imbuing it with aura. She then strikes the ground, 
causing her aura blade to destroy some of it while lodging into a nearby tree until it eventually splits in half. They can't believe Karnak bagged an aura user. Sarati greets them, saying that she is looking forward to working with them all. Japella just wonders why she is working in such a place. A few weeks later, Sarati is sparring inside the training grounds. Gilamon says that guy sure is struggling, and the other knight says he knows how that feels, with their weight difference and just her strength alone, it's hard to understand how he's getting pushed back, and the aura users are incredible. The man's sword flies through the air, signifying the end of the duel as it hits the ground. He says they should end things here today, and she tells him good work. Barros thanks her for helping with the knight's training, then asks her if they can fight next. They collide swords, and he explains that her use of battle aura is still a little awkward and that she wastes her power too much. She'll need to be able to use the right amount of power with each strike, and she says that's a lot easier said than done. She creates some distance and says surely he can just possess her body like he did before, and if she experiences it a few more times, she thinks she'll get a feel for it. Barrow says it'd be best not to do it more than once, and if you do it more than three times, your soul will corrupt, and you will go crazy. He says that she can get stronger without that, as she is talented. She didn't realize they did something so dangerous. Barrow says he needs her help to awaken his battle aura in the afternoon, so they should end their spar. It takes us back inside to Karnak sitting at his table, saying there's no way of knowing just how Strath combined necromancy with divinity, and he wonders if it's some kind of ability to combine the powers together. But he says there's no way, as he definitely would have heard of it. He starts to pull out his hair, saying he has no clue what to do but decides he'll think about it later, and for now, he should block the hole that's spreading darkness. He begins to form something with his chaos mana, saying he understands that the darkness of the end flows somehow and gets through time and space to spread throughout the land. So he decides to make a powerful entity that can investigate dangerous time and space, whatever the hell that means. He starts to order the mana, saying to watch the darkness down several strands and manipulate it in detail without making any mistakes as it slowly but surely starts to take form. We see an eyeball, and he calls it the time-space investigation powerful entity. Bro is also banned from naming, and it's called the Eye of Darkness. Karnak asks Barros if he seriously has yet to awaken his battle aura, saying that he thought he was the world's greatest martial artist. They are within the forest in the Deventer territory, next to the Gestured territory. Barros sighs, saying that was before he regressed, and he misses when he was the Death King, and it made things easier when he would just give him dark battle aura. Karnak tells him that it's not like he can go back either. Sarati wonders what the hell she just listened to. Then a bit later, after she's been told everything, she is completely confused, asking how these idiots are the cause of everything. She says she guesses it makes sense, since she already thought they weren't ordinary knights or nobles, but to think they were transcendents that took over the world. She wonders how she even got involved with them in the first place, as they are pigging out. She says that she knows they're trying to raise the Eye of Darkness, but asks why they are here in the Deventer territory. Karnak says he doesn't want to use necromancy in his territory in case they get caught. Sarati has no idea what he is talking about. But later in the night, Karnak says it's about time as we see the Eye of Darkness in his hand. Sarati asks what he's planning to do with it. He says that he's going to send this through time space to see if there's a way to close the door of darkness. He launches it straight up into the sky, kind of like a firework, minus the fact there's no sound. Sarati says it's really quiet. Karnak says it's because they didn't open up time space, it's only looking inside. He says he'll try to use the eye to enter the infinity realm while unconscious, so they need to protect him. He closes his eyes and begins to enter the eye, saying that it seems like it's working. Because he now has control of it, he looks around, seeing a vast ocean-like landscape with a tree off in the distance. He floats over to it, saying that it looks like he found it, and it is the tree of emptiness. This is the true form of the authority he used to wield, and he knows he shouldn't be the one to say this, but it's hella ugly. One of the fruits falls off the tree into the water, and he now understands how the darkness of the end has been spreading, and that he has to stop this. He floats around the tree, wondering where the core of the authority is, and spots a giant purple orb in the middle of the tree, and he says that it looks like it's over there, and he might be able to get some information out of it. But he hears a voice that says, stay back mortal, which jump scares him a little bit. The voice says that this place is forbidden for those who are destined to disappear, and he asks the voice who they are, and they introduce themselves as death and darkness, saying that they are destined to destroy. They begin to cause the water to swirl violently at high speeds, and it knocks the eye of darkness away. Karnak says this is his power, asking how it's able to control it with ease. And then the voice says it's all in the name of Tesranik. 
Karnak thought that it was just a fake god, but it turns out that it's actually real, and the voice tells him to return, calling him a pitiful mortal as it begins to glow orange, then launches an attack, destroying the Eye of Darkness, causing Karnak to scream awake. Barros calls out to him, asking if he is okay, and Karnak holds his head, asking what happened. Barros says that his body started floating, and he passed out, asking what went wrong. Karnak says they can talk about it later, and asks him to repeat what the name of the god those cultists believed in was. Barros says it was the god of death or something, bro forgot. Sarati says they were talking about Tesrainik, the dark god of death that the Order of the Black God serves. Karnak tells Barros that he was actually there. Barros is completely surprised, asking if he is real, and Karnak says there's no way that's possible, asking why something like this exists. It jumps to three giant beams of light, as a man who is part of the Order of the Black God named the Pope of Death says there's a problem with the sanctuary. The Dark Lord asks how that's possible, saying that it's considered a sanctuary because nothing can approach it, and the woman named the Princess of Destruction also says that's odd, and she'll have to confirm it herself. We see a bell ringing, and she talks about how it's odd there's an issue, how it's weird that there's something in the sanctuary. A maid enters the room calling out to her lord named Elazar, and we see it's the Princess of Destruction without her guise on, and she asks her maid to get somebody named Huddle for her, and we learn that her name is Elazar de Replacian, and she is an imperial mage of the Lenarcia Empire. One of the three archmages and the Princess of Destruction. Back at Karnak's house, he says in the end he couldn't find a way to stop the opening, and he tried to approach it multiple times to no avail, and if this continues they'll be found out, which is too dangerous. All he can figure out right now is that the Order of the Black God believes in this Tesrainik. The issue is what kind of stance they're taking. Barros asks what he means, and Karnak explains that he doesn't know if they are people taking advantage of power that falls from the tree, or if they are people that are disturbing the tree to obtain power at random. If it's the latter, it becomes an issue. Sarati asks what's different, and Karnak explains that disturbing the tree means that they are able to influence powers beyond time and space. That means they can grow the realm, and that is a difficult task that took him years to accomplish. Karnak explains that if that means that they are able to disturb the tree, it means they have more power than he was when he was the Death King. And if they have that kind of power, there's no need for them to do anything unnecessary. That's also why they are able to contain that Tezranok being in the void. Barros asks where the hell that bastard even came from. And Sarati chirps up, saying that maybe part of his power gained consciousness and became Tesrainik. Barros sighs, asking how that would make sense in the first place, but Karnak agrees with her. Barros feels betrayed, and says that nothing about this makes sense, asking how the tree itself is named Tesrainik and is acting as a god. Which means that Karnak is capable of making gods, and that he needs to control his kids. Karnak gets embarrassed, saying that it's not true, and Sarati says that they also don't know the truth either. And they all feel defeated. Karnak says that he will need to go into the order of the black god if he wants to gain any useful information. Barros says that it's going to be hard to find them with their current methods. And Karnak thinks about it, saying that he guesses they'll have to enter the King's Order. The King's Order is a special imperial organization created to hunt members of the Order of the Black God. After the Age of Chaos, unlike the Orders of the Seven Goddesses, Orders, Inquisitors and Darkness Hunters have been killing necromancers. Despite this, the appearance of the Order of the Black God throughout the continent started to cause issues, especially since plenty of members are high nobles or royalty that joined. And it was difficult for the Seven Goddesses to handle everything on their own. Which is why the Seven Nations got together and developed a special division called the King's Order. Members of the King's Order are given the right of censors, allowing for them to investigate those suspected to be cultists, with rare cases allowing them to execute individuals. Because of that, the selection conditions are strict, and you are only able to join the referrals. Which is another issue for them, and Karnak asks how he's meant to have connections to an imperial organization. Karnak says he was known as a dark hunter for a long time. Maybe he spent his time at the capital instead. Sarati asks if this is the only thing limiting their plan, and if that's the case, she can give them the opportunity to apply right now. They're both excited that she actually has connections like that. Karnak munches for celebration, saying that's his servant. The next morning we hear Jepel screaming out for Karnak. He says that he needs to leave for a bit and not to worry, so he'll bring back fame and honor to the family. Jeppel wonders why he ran off again without telling him. In Dirarth City, we see them sitting down and Barros asks if it's okay for them to leave like this. Karnak says old man Jeppel would have stopped them if they didn't, and as a lord, he's not supposed to leave for long periods. 
a familiar approaches them saying that they can't believe the three of them are already here and he's sorry for being late. Karnak and Barros get excited because this means that the referral is finally here. Karnak asks Alias how he's been, thanking him for coming even though they contacted him at the last minute. He says he was happy to hear from them. It jumps to the last night, and they learn that Sarati asks Alias for the recommendation. Karnak asks how that would help since the King's Order and the Seven Goddesses Order are separate organizations. Sarati says they aren't completely unrelated. You need a cleric to catch a necromancer. Since the King's Order needs support from a cleric of the Seven Goddesses Order, when they are accepting members, there is a condition that they need to receive a recommendation or be vetted by them. A first-rank Inquisitor like Alias obviously has the authority to give such a recommendation. Karnak asks her how she knows this. She says she heard it from him himself, and that he called them all to the Ranfell incident in the first place to give them a recommendation. Flashback ends, and Alias says it was a shame when Karnak said he was going to suddenly return to his territory and that he was going to recommend him to be part of the King's Order. He's happy that they returned like this. Karnak says that they couldn't miss such an opportunity, and Alias hands him the letter, saying that he can take it to the headquarters. It won't guarantee him joining, but it'll help. He gives them a prayer. Karnak, thanks him, and they head off to, the Ustil Kingdom's capital called Drunta, specifically to the King's Order headquarters. We start to see some of the people inside of the King's Order, and Karnak says that everybody seems quite talented and they're better than he expected. Sarati says that she saw two Aura users in the capital, and this place is just different. A man opens the door, telling them that they must have waited a while, and they confirmed the recommendation later, so he'll guide them to the Order Lord. They head into a room as a man welcomes them, and he introduces himself as the commander of the King's Order. His name is Arendel von Nayad, and he is a purple ranked knight. Karnak says he's glad to meet him, and Arendel says he confirmed the letter, and the three of them are qualified, and their identities are secure as well. Above all, the recommendation is from Alias, which means it is very trustworthy. However, they must know that it is not enough to enter the King's Order. Karnak says he heard about it roughly, that there is a training period for new members. Arendel says it's to prevent pagans from infiltrating, so they should hopefully understand that he will now give them their first task. Barros asks how, and they all look a bit sad since they just joined. Arendel laughs, saying that's what their line of work is like, and there's always work leaving them swamped, and he laughs more, saying he hopes they look forward to it. Karnak hopes they won't work them like dogs before abandoning them. Outside of the room, we see them standing in front of a group, and one of the men introduces himself as Tarman, the 4th Battalion's general. He is a 5th Circle Mage. We are also introduced to Kald and Alice. Kald is a swordsman, and Alice is a 2nd rank Inquisitor. Karnak says it's nice to meet them but asks if the Order is always so busy that he has to start work immediately after joining. Tarman says he had bad timing, and he came on a day when they got a mission. Barrow says he didn't expect the general to be a mage. He asks if it's strange for a 5th Circle Mage to have Ori users as his subordinate. Barrow says he didn't mean to make it sound like he was weak. Tarman says in their line of work, identity is also a part of ability because they have to deal with secular powers, and as they work, he'll learn more about the Order, such as collecting information, tracking down pagans, abducting key figures, and interrogation rather than fighting. Just because you're good at fighting doesn't mean you'll be good in this line of work. Sarati asks why it sounds like there are only evil missions, and Tarman laughs, saying their job is to do wicked things to begin with. That's why mages that use diverse methods are more advantageous in this line of work than Aura users. Sarati asks if that means clerics are qualified as well. And Alice explains that the King's Order was also made to keep the Seven Goddesses Order in check, and they cannot give a priest a general position. Tarman says that he'll now explain the mission. They received information that a regional noble has joined the Order of the Black God. The suspect is Count Brawlant, located south of the Eustil Kingdom. They will disguise themselves as adventurers and go straight to Brawlant County and get proper evidence before punishing the Count with the King's name. And he laughs, saying that's actually all the info he has, as they don't know anything else. Karnak is surprised, asking how they're meant to know if he's actually a pagan or not. Tarmut awkwardly laughs, and we see them all making pain faces, and he says that's what the King's order is for, to find such things out. Karnak and the gang don't look like they're excited for this. And he says now he understands why this place is so busy. It jumps to Count Brawlant's castle as we see his son is sick. A robed man enters the room, saying that his son's sickness is getting worse by the day and that he needs to open his eyes. Brawlant says no way, saying that he understands the fate of somebody who falls into necromancy. And there's no such thing as bringing somebody back from the dead, it's just moving a corpse. 
The man says until now that was the case, but they can't call that true necromancy, and they need to serve Tesrainik, the true power of darkness, and use it properly. And he says that if he does, death won't be fate but merely the result that those who cannot cure illness will face. And his son is still young, asking how he's meant to accept that the fate that such a young boy dying is natural. His son grabs onto his hand, and the father starts to genuinely consider it as he can see how sick his son is. And he says the seven goddesses order wasn't of any help, and if he can give his son a new life, he might as well do it. And he tells the man that he will convert to Tesrainik, asking if they will accept him. It cuts to an inn on the outskirts of Brawlant County, and Tarman says they'll now begin collecting information. And it may be obvious, but they cannot let it be known that they're from the king's order. They need to use methods that seem unrelated to pagans. Tarman hands them all a note, and they ask what it is. And Tarman says his name is Holoncrat. He's a notorious wanted criminal in the capital, and he's talented at disguises, so he has yet to be caught. They all look at it, and Karnak asks if he's related to the incident. And Tarman says not at all. And although he looks like that, he's actually one of their members. And from now on, they are bounty hunters chasing him. At least that is their disguise. And he tells them to split into teams and go around and investigate. The groups are Karnak and Kald, Alice and Sarati. And at the manor itself, we see Tarman and Barrow sitting down as Tarman says they are bounty hunters from the Adventurer's Guild. And he thinks that the criminal they're looking for is here, asking if he will cooperate. Brawlant says of course, that a dangerous man going through their territory is bad for them too, so he will cooperate. Tarman, thanks him, saying they won't do anything that will get him in trouble. And as they leave, Barros asks if that's really all it is. And Tarman says yes, they should head back to the inn. Barros then asks what's the point of the meeting with the Count if this is all they are going to do. And Tarman says although it doesn't seem like much, it was enough, as he's already caught on to something. That night, Tarman says it's time for them to exchange information. Kalt starts off by saying that he has learned Count Brawlett lost his wife and that his son is his only remaining family. Tarman adds that his son has been suffering from an incurable disease that even holy healing spells cannot resolve. Tarman says it's a perfect case for cultists to take advantage of. Kald mentions another suspicious point, the crime rate dropped drastically, and the Count led the charge to expel many criminals. But if that's the case, those criminals would have moved to other towns. He asks if there have been any rumors of crime rates going up elsewhere. Alice says that mass disappearances are a common occurrence when dealing with necromancers. Tarman says that he and Barros visited the Count himself and found something interesting. Every window was fitted with thick curtains, as if there was a need to block out the sun. Kald says this all sounds very familiar, which means it's a specific type, a vampire. That night, at Brawlant Castle, we see the Count and his son at dinner. The Count asks his son if he despises him. The son asks why he would hate him, saying he didn't realize that life could be so calming. He says all humans already need to kill to survive, and he merely drinks what is obtained through the order and does not hurt anybody. His diet may have changed, but that's all, and this is way better than death. Brawlant says he's glad his son thinks so, and that he's truly glad his son hasn't changed, he's still polite and vigilant. The Count now believes that the Order of the Black God are not heretics, they're merely the new truth of a new age. When Tesrainik sets foot on these lands, he will create a heaven that balances life and death, and his son will be able to live a normal life once more. He tells his son that it may be uncomfortable now, but he needs to endure it for a little while, as he won't live in that body forever. The next morning, Sarati calls out to Alice, saying that since they know what he is, why should they keep investigating? Alice says they need to remain vigilant until they find absolute evidence, and it'll just take a little more time. Someone calls out to them, asking if they are bounty hunters. Alice says yes, asking what they need. The man hands them a note, saying they found the man they wanted, and the Count wanted them to go tell the others. Sarati wonders how they found a fake man. Back at the inn, Tarman asks why the Count would send four of them to the hideout of a non-existent criminal. Alice says she has no idea, but they were told the criminal returns to sleep there every night and to ambush him. Kald says that since he specified night, his son is definitely a vampire. Tarman recognizes it as a trap, asking who would fall for such an obvious lie. Karnak says this makes things troublesome. If they ignore the information, the cultists will know they suspect them. If that happens, they'll begin digging into them. Kald, Tarman, and Alice are all surprised, saying that he's right. Karnak just wonders how they're all so smooth-brained. Kald asks Tarman what to do since it's going to be dangerous if it's a trap. Tarman says they have no choice, they should just play into their hands. 
That night at a shit shack in the woods, Sarati says that everyone is calmer than she expected and asks how strong vampires are. Carmen says they're just a few times stronger than humans, so there's nothing she should be scared of. She says she thought ancient vampires were really strong, and Cald says they're often discovered quickly, so it's impossible for them to stay alive for long. She asks what happens if an aura user or a mage becomes a vampire, and Tarman says they won't be able to use aura or magic, so they become much weaker. Tarman asks her if she's worried, saying she shouldn't worry, as they're the kingdom's cream of the crop, and a vampire is nothing they can't handle. As he's talking, Karnak notices a bright light from the window as a giant fire attack comes from the sky, blowing up the cabin. They start coughing as Alice puts up a protective barrier, saying they actually did try to sneak attack them. They wonder when it happened since they couldn't sense anybody, and one of them says as he thought it was the king's order, and no mere bounty hunter could dodge that strike. Sarati is surprised there's aura, saying she thought vampires couldn't use it. Even Tarman is surprised, and Cald says that that is Sir Durald, the strongest knight of Count Brawlant, asking why an aura user would become a vampire. Tarman says he's not sure about the details, but it's clear that Brawlin has cooperated with the pagans, and with the authority given to the king's order, he declares them the enemy of the goddess and the king, and they should kneel and receive their judgment. They start to laugh, asking who they are meant to kneel to, and Tarman warns them that if they do not oblige, the only option would be to enact judgment. Since they have no interest, he tells them to punish them in the name of the king. Durald tells his soldiers to go forth in the name of Tesrainik. One of the vampires rears his fist back and starts to attack Kald, who manages to deflect all of his attacks before countering with his own, slicing one of the vampires across the chest. We see a black fog leave his wound, and he says that a wound like this is nothing. But while he's talking, Alice comes in with a super bright blue spell, saying that all impurity shall burn in front of the light of the goddess. The vampires scream in pain, saying they need to get the priestess first. One of them heads straight for her, and Tarman says he won't allow that. He begins to imbue Aura into his staff as something travels along the ground, and he tells it to come out as he summons a golem that knocks one of the vampires into the air. He follows it up with lightning blasts, zapping the vampire, low-key deep frying it. Carmen sighs, then looks over at Karnak and them saying he thought they were weaker, but Barros is easily handling multiple vampires at the same time, and he trusts Karnak with his back enough that Karnak's handling his own. Carmen wonders how people this skilled were not known until recently, however, he still looks worried as he begins to charge even more lightning. As Alice and Cald are fighting on one side, we see Sarati engaging in an absolute brawl with Durald on the other. Carmen says that the fight is going to rest on her shoulders, saying even though they are both red knights, he wonders if she, who has less experience, can defeat him. We see a heavy collision from the two of them, the impact creates massive shock waves, and the wind pressure alone destroys some of the ground and shakes the forest. Sarati manages to stop herself from flying too far back, and Durald begins to walk forward, saying she has a pretty face and her skills aren't bad either, but sadly, she is no match for him. As the fight continues to wage on with everybody in their own battle, some of the vampires scream out yelling at each other not to back away as Tesrainik is protecting them. Even if they die, the god of death shall grant them resurrection. Karnak says the religion is no joke and he never imagined a vampire could be an Ori user as the thought never once crossed his mind. Barrow says it'll be troublesome if Durald joins in with the vampires. Karnak asks how Sarati is doing as we see her backpedaling away from another attack. She says even though she has more battle aura, she can't counterattack at all. She thought the vampires were supposed to lose their battle aura and mana after being converted, and then they would have to train their dark magic from scratch. So how is this possible? Durald says the classic Mad Max line of witness me and that this is the great power bestowed upon him by Tesrainik and he can use Aura despite being a vampire. Sarati asks Karnak and Barros if vampires have any weaknesses. Barros says that if he knew one, he would have already used it to end the fight. She asks if Barros could join her, saying she doesn't think she can handle this by herself. Barros says he won't be able to help her at all without Aura. Instead, they could try Plan P as she still has two more chances. She barks at him, asking if he thinks she's stupid, saying she could actually lose her mind if things go wrong but she cheers herself up, saying she has to beat him no matter what. Since it's coming to this, she's just going to overwhelm him with her aura. Karnak says good luck, and Barros says she's chalked. She swings her sword, unleashing an aura slash towards Durald, who blocks it, asking why it feels so heavy. She starts to leap in, and he says nothing's going to change just because she has more aura. He avoids her attack by leaping into the air, saying she seems to forget he has Lord Tesrainik's power on his side. 
he swings at her using his own aura slash, sending her flying backward. She's surprised and annoyed that she can't even push him back with her aura, wondering what she can do. Barros says not like that. She asks what he means, and he says that he's already told her before about how she wastes her movements. She still tries to recall when he took control of her body and reenacts the sensation she felt then. She needs to force her battle aura to concentrate into a single spot. She starts to do exactly that, channeling it into her blade, condensing it. He says her body should still remember what it was like, and she needs to unify her mind and think of it as purifying the aura around her blade. As she begins to get deep in thought, focusing on that exact thing, her aura burns even brighter than it did before. Durald recognizes it, saying that it's getting sharper. He doesn't know what she's doing, but it's going to be pointless as he charges in. She thinks if Barros were in this situation, she'd know what he would do. She opens her eyes, swinging her blade at him, and it actually connects, sending him soaring through the air. She's just surprised that it worked. He begins to attack her from the sky using his aura strikes. After he lands, she begins to dance around him, not giving him a chance to counterattack. She says that she's getting the hang of it now, and this is why Barros was able to toy with her. What she should have been aiming for was not their sword or their body, but understanding her opponent's intent. She swings again, causing him to jump to avoid it, and he comes from behind, saying it looked like she had a pretty good card up her sleeve, but this is pointless. She manages to block his attack, which surprises him, and she says that she needs to focus on understanding his movements ahead of time. She starts to see it all slow down, realizing this is what she needs to take advantage of. She channels her inner Barros, using the fact that he slowed down to dish out a very swift counterattack that heavily injures Durl. Even though he blocked it with his sword, it still cut deep onto his chest. Karnak says it looks like they're not going to need to help her. Barros says it's about damn time that she got the hang of it. Carmen also says that she's doing well, and with things coming to an end on their side, they'll definitely have the upper hand. Durald wonders what's going on, saying this is like she's an entirely different person from earlier and that he can't fall like this after having been given new power by Tesseranic. Even if he has to overdo it, he'll end things here. He lets out a scream as he begins to pour out every bit of aura that he has, constantly trying his best to concentrate it into his blade. He says that he's not going to hold back anymore. He launches a fiery aura attack at Sarati. Kald says there's no way he'll be fine afterward if he overexerts his battle aura like this. Carmen says he must be trying to take advantage of his regeneration, and they both warn Sarati that it's dangerous and she should just step back. But she says there's no reason to do that as she begins to channel even more of her aura, saying that he's not the only one who can regenerate his limbs. Karnak and Barros watch as she stands on business, swinging her sword down into his attack saying she would like to see who will come out on top. As their auras collide with one another, it shines violently as it explodes, shattering the ground beneath it, sending rocks flying into the forest. The wind pressure alone is enough to make everybody close their eyes, and they call her reckless. They look up, wondering what happened as the dust begins to settle. Durald's head falls onto the floor as he says there's no way. Sarati instantly stabs her sword into his head, and we see her panting as she's gassed out. Alice calls out to her, and later we see her healing Sarati with her magic. Sarati thanks her, and Alice says they are the ones who are thankful to her and that they would have died if not for her. Carmen says thanks to her hard work, they now have evidence of the Count's crimes, and that Alice should go contact headquarters and let them know that they are ready to judge the Count's house of Brawland. It jumps to the Count's castle as they are now being raided by the King's order. Alice says that in the name of the Goddess, she'll punish evil. It's the same magic she used on the vampires outside the shack and we see them doing their best to block it, but they are just getting bodied. Outside of the Count's office, he hears them saying they need to find his son as well. He looks down at the blade in his hand, telling Tesrainik to watch over him as he stabs it into his own throat, taking his life. We see outside of the castle that his son is running away in the forest, and he keeps looking back as the two men with him say that he needs to look forward as they don't know how long they'll be chased for. His son grits his teeth, saying that he'll get his revenge no matter what, and in the name of Tesrainik, He'll make sure that it happens. As his son continued running through the woods, we hear Karnak saying it's just as he thought, he knew they would come this way. The men ask who he is, surprised, and Karnak says they can't just leak a trail of necromancy power like that. They recognize that he's part of the king's order and tell the young master to run away, wondering how Karnak got here so fast. Karnak stretches his hand out, using his necromancer's aura, as a giant purple hand grasps onto them, and he says now he'll get straight to the point. Sarati wonders who the real bad guy is here. We see him extracting their power from their corpses, 
and Sarati says she can't get used to this stuff, but Karnak says they're all set. He snaps his fingers as the corpses set ablaze, and she asks why he's burning them, saying they need to report that they found them. Karnak says that won't do, he ate up all the darkness of the end they had, after all. She asks why he would do that and calls him a pig. Barrow says he's accumulating a lot of power, and it won't be manageable with just chaos magic alone, asking if he's sure about this. Karnak says it doesn't seem like the situation will allow for such sluggishness anyway. She asks what he's worried about, and he says that both Durald and Strath worry him. Strath maintained his holy power despite being a necromancer, and Durald was able to use Aura despite being a vampire. Barros asks what the deal is since they took care of them in the end. Karnak says they did, but the fact that they didn't lose their power is no small matter. As they might know, energies don't mix, and that's why, in order to learn something, you need to give up the others, but that rule has now been broken. With the darkness of the end, mages can use both magic and necromancy, and aura users can use both aura and necromancy. Barros says it's always been a thing though, like arch liches or death knights. Karnak says in those cases, there's a side effect of becoming undead or losing your sanity. Now you can keep your mind while using your old powers and necromancy, and the strong who have steered clear of necromancy until now will begin experimenting with it. Even the fourth martial king and the three grand mages could become their enemies, and just getting a little stronger won't cut it, he needs to gather as much power as he possibly can. Back at the headquarters, Aronel says good work on the last mission, and that Tarman praised their conduct very highly. He was wondering if they would like to join the king's order right now, considering everything they've done in their previous mission. Karnak asks if this means they can join right now, and Aronel says yes, handing them all an insignia and welcoming them. They all start to talk about what they're going to eat for celebration, and Aronel reminds them that they have to start working immediately, giving them a whole lot of paperwork, saying there's a lot that's been piled up. They all stare at it, wondering if they maybe made a mistake by joining the king's order. And so, the days of working passed by. They would annihilate cultists, teach necromancers lessons, fake reports, steal the darkness of the end, and repeat this over and over and over again with each passing day. After some time, we see Karnak looking at all the necromancy power he's gathered, saying it's quite a bit, and now maybe he can separate the energy of chaos mana and then recombine it with the necromancy power. He begins to do the exact same thing Strath did in the basement. As it starts to form together, we see a darker red aura than before begin to float around the room, and he says this is good as he is now finally at the sixth circle. Back at the headquarters, some men are talking about how Baron Karnak is already a sixth circle mage and that he joined recently as a fourth circle. They say he must be a god-given talent. Karnak starts to bluff, saying he's talented. Barrow celebrates, and Sarati's just embarrassed as hell. She begs him to stop. Outside of Arental's room, we hear him laughing as we see he says that they might actually have a grand mage on their hands, and Karnak's just glad nobody's suspecting him of being a necromancer. Arental says he has more good news, the captain's spot at the 7th division is empty, and he would like Karnak to take it. Karnak asks if he's sure, and Arental says yes, everybody agreed on it, and looking at his contributions, he's more than worthy, and people have great expectations of him, so he should keep working hard. Karnak says he understands but realizes that a promotion means just even more work, and it's gonna be easier to catch culsets, but he'll have more to do. It jumps to a whole week later. Southeast of the Eustil Kingdom border, there is a fortress called Arthra. In the basement of the tower, we hear a girl praying to the goddess, hoping that she'll put a soul to rest. She says this is horrible. She's a second-ranking inquisitor and also part of the king's order, specifically Karnak's division, and her name is Milia. She says this is horrible. She knows inquisitors must hold cultists, but she's grateful that she gets to stay outside while Karnak does his thing, and she calls him a good man. The necromancer is screaming, saying that he'll just tell them everything, and Barrow says he doesn't care, he just wants to hear him scream. Karnak is surprised, saying this one's lasting a while, and Sarati says that she thinks they've done enough to pretend like they're questioning him, and Milia will believe it. Barros then tells him that the dude actually just died. Karnak says this is good, and he stands up, saying it's his turn now. He uses his blue mind control magic, and the corpse just starts yapping. Bro is having none of it, and he sighs, saying he can't believe this is another bust. Each and every one of them unironically believes in Tesrainik, and he wonders why none of them know the truth. Sarati says from what they've discovered so far is that their order is ruled by three leaders. They have six cardinals and thirteen bishops, and each region's bishop runs their own small organization. So far they've only captured normal priests, 
so they have no good information. Barros says that they're going to have to at least capture a bishop, and Karnak says he was hoping they could get someone higher up on the ladder, hoping for something big to occur. At Arantel's office, he's reading the notes asking about the mission, and he says there's a rumor that someone in Drunta cooperated with the cults, Karnak wonders what's going on with him, as he's acting nervous. So he asks who the suspect is, and Arantel says that the suspect is none other than the second prince of the Eustil kingdom, His Highness Alfred Luton Eustil. This is the big thing that Karnak actually was hoping for. In the Eustil kingdom, the current king is Wiscott I, and he has two sons who are fiercely competing over who will succeed him. There is the first prince, Lloyd, and the second prince, Alfred, who we just learned about. Although it would make sense for the first prince, Lloyd, to succeed the king, he has a tragic backstory. Malia of the Count Feeler family was accepted into the nobility through an arranged marriage and became the true queen. However, over the last few decades, their inability to have a child was considered a significant issue for the future of the family. So, in order to gain an heir to the throne, the king had no choice but to accept Calpia from the Marquis Talian family. Three months after she joined the family, there was news of her pregnancy. That child was Lloyd, the first prince. The king was elated and announced Prince Lloyd as his successor in the name of the goddess Allium. However, that was when Queen Malia was finally able to have a child herself, and that child was none other than Alfred. The royal household was thrown into disarray, the eldest prince versus the direct bloodline second prince. Since it was difficult to determine who was more important, deciding who would succeed the king became a tough decision. King Wiscott could not decide and told them he would make a decision once both princes became adults. After learning the story, Barros says he's sure that brought a lot of repercussions. They are back in the capital of Drunta. Karnak says surely that would mean one of the princes become king if something happened to the other. It's no surprise that the two families that have served the princes for the last 20 years have not stopped fighting. Barros laughs, saying it's a shit show. Sarati says that if there's not enough reason, isn't choosing based on their ability or personality the easiest thing to do? Karnak says if they're picking based on personality, Lloyd is calm and collected, making him more suited for the throne, whereas Alfred is violent and arrogant. As for their abilities, they haven't had a chance to show them off since they are still too young. Sarati asks if there's a reason why the king hasn't selected Lloyd yet. Karnak says it must be because he's incredibly weak. Apparently, ever since he was little, he's never been healthy for long, and despite learning sword skills, it seems like he can't demonstrate any. Whereas Alfred is strong and talented in martial arts. Sarati says that complicates things. Asking who reported that Alfred was colluding with the Dark Order? Karnak says it was a spy planted by Lloyd. Since the prince was concerned, he sent an informal report to the king's order. Before Arantel took over the king's order, he was the vice commander of the Imperial Knights. That's how he was able to recognize the first prince's handwriting. But that's about all he knows for now. As they stop outside an inn, he says that they told him they'll send a messenger later for more details. Barros asks what the hell they're doing here and if this is where they're meeting the spy, calling it old. Karnak says yes, and they should head inside. Once they do, they look around, spotting a man who's instantly blowing his own cover by acting hella nervous. They approach him, and the man asks what he wants. Barros says the dude's acting is awful. Karnak asks if he's the one who received orders from Lloyd. The person's shoulders instantly stop drooping, and he says that they must be the people selected by Arendel. Barros realizes the atmosphere has changed and says that he needs the man to state his identity. The man hesitates, saying that all he can do is show his face. As soon as he takes off his mask, they are all surprised it is none other than Prince Alford. Karnak wonders what's going on, saying that the one who reported Alford is none other than himself. Alford says it seems like they're confused. While he is wearing the face of Alford, he is not Alford. Rather, he is Lloyd, the first prince, the rightful heir to the throne. Karnak asks if that means their souls have been swapped. Lloyd says yes. We're going to swap their names from now on because their bodies are swapped. Karnak says he didn't notice since he was too shocked, but now that he looks closer, he can tell that his soul is in the wrong body and that it's disrupted. Lloyd says he assumes that it's hard for them to believe, but Karnak says there are plenty of spells in necromancy that can cause this. Lloyd smiles, saying that he knew he did a good job in contacting the king's order, and he knew they would recognize instantly that it was a necromancy spell. He wonders if maybe other magicians would also be able to notice it instantly. He says it would be impossible with a mere magical eye. Karnak says he is only able to understand it because he can see the facts, and Lloyd asks how a non-necromancer is able to believe that he is Lloyd. 
Karnak says it would be odd for him to act as someone else and say that he reported himself, and members of the King's Order have basic knowledge of necromancy. Lloyd sighs, asking if there is no way to prove that he is under a spell. Karnak says they should first look at the facts of this event, asking him to explain the details of what happened the day their souls swapped. Lloyd thinks about it, saying it was around five days ago. He was going through his daily treatment of holy magic before going to bed. Barros is surprised he gets healed with holy magic daily. Lloyd asks if he is unaware of the rumors about how weak he is. Barros says that is true and laughs, saying even zombies are healthier than this dude. Lloyd continues, saying without any issue, he fell asleep and the entire estate is always protected by a holy barrier anyway. However, he woke up in his brother's body, asking if necromancy is this strong. Karnak says that something doesn't make sense to him. That means they were able to cast a necromancy spell capable of piercing through the barrier, and they must have prepared something within the estate. Yet there has been no evidence of anything. Lloyd says he was in an odd place when he woke up. As we see him opening his eyes, he wonders where he is and why his body doesn't feel heavy or painful. He looks down at his thighs, wondering why they are so big, and looks around the room, wondering if he has been kidnapped. A voice then calls out to him, asking if he is awake, and he glares, asking what they have done to him. They say that it seems he is unaware, so they will show him as they pull out a mirror. He finally gets to look at his face, seeing that it is none other than Alford. The man laughs, saying that they have switched bodies, and it is a result of the great power their lord Tesrainik holds. Lloyd gets angry, realizing their cult is behind this, and asks why they swapped their bodies. Another man steps up, and Lloyd recognizes him as Sir Sebastian, one of Alfred's henchmen. Lloyd asks why he would betray Alfred, and Sebastian asks why he thinks this is betrayal. Lloyd says that he put him in his old, weak body, and Sebastian laughs, saying he guesses that's one way to interpret it. Lloyd starts to realize, based on his actions, that Alfred must be behind this and asks them what they want. Sebastian says nothing in particular and closes the door, saying all he has to do is sit in here and be a good boy. Lloyd runs to the door, telling them to wait, and that is what he did. Every window was locked, and so were the doors. However, he didn't hate staying there. He wasn't sick, and the meals were good. The happiness you get when eating good food is amazing. Barros and Karnak now realize this dude is a man of culture. Sarati asks how he was able to escape if everything was locked, and he says about that, even if he tells them, they definitely will not believe him. Back when he was eating, Lloyd says this is the first time he's ever feasted in his life. He wonders what they're planning since they're treating him so well. He wants to get out of there, but there are too many eyes on him. He notices that they're taking the utmost care of this body. There's a chance he could escape if he uses it as a captive. He says he can feel a strong life force in the body, and it might actually be able to do it. We then jump to some knights escorting a maid, and they ask why there are four of them to serve one meal. One of them says that Sebastian is worried. Another one laughs, asking if the prince even knows how to wield a sword, telling Lloyd it's time to eat. As soon as they enter, they don't see him because he's hiding behind the door. When they pass by, he hits one with a karate chop to the neck, stealing the man's blade, which alerts the others. They realize he knocked that guy out and hit his weak spot fast, confirming that it should be Lloyd inside Alfred's body. Lloyd says they must be surprised, asking if they've ever learned how to use a sword in a dying body, where you need to rely exclusively on strategy and technique while using as little movement as possible. But now that he's in a healthy body, he wonders what they think will happen. He says actions speak louder than words and that he'll show them personally, as he dashes in, turning these guys into fruit from Fruit Ninja. The maid is scared as the knight's corpses fall to the floor, and Lloyd looks over at her, telling her not to worry as he does not plan to harm her. He then closes the door, leaving her inside and telling her to stay put for a little bit. As he goes to leave, he says that Alfred was only strong because his body is so well developed, and now he needs to leave carefully. Some guards spot him, and he says this is unlucky. He goes to draw his blade, and they ask him where he's headed, calling him Alfred, and asking if it's not his meal time. Lloyd is surprised that the guy hasn't learned about him at all and realizes they are not in on the plan. Only a few people knew their bodies were switched, and thanks to that, he was able to hop over the walls while pretending to leave for a stroll. But he has nowhere to go with his body, and he doesn't think his servants would believe him either, so he asked the king's order for help and hid himself in the slums. That is the end of the story so far. Karnak says it'd be better to capture the cultists who have done this, but the issue is that cultists are hard to find once they go into hiding, and they likely have already evacuated the manor where he was held and moved on. Barros asks if they should send scouts to track them down, 
But Karnak says they can't waste time when they don't know what Alfred is planning and that they need to make the necromancers come to them. Lloyd says he guesses he'll need to act as bait, and he looks determined, but Karnak says he won't be enough since knights should be able to capture him. Lloyd asks if there is another option, and Karnak says they can prepare bait no necromancer can refuse. Sarati realizes this is going to be bad. A few days later, on the outskirts of Drunta, we are taken to the hideout of Prince Alfred's supporters. We see Sebastian looking around, wondering where he's gone, saying if he has contacted the group it will be trouble. Somebody else says that won't happen as the spies they planted in the palace have said nothing so far. He's part of the Order of the Black God and is a bishop named Detsras. His two direct subordinates, Borson and Jelfarent, also say they have taken many measures to prevent anything from happening. Borson says they need to bring Prince Alfred's body here at the right time. Detsra's necromancy aura begins to seep out, and he says the spell he cast is intact for the soul swap, so there are no problems. Sebastian says even if there are no problems, they should stay vigilant, asking if they can use necromancy to track his body down. Detsra says they can't, as if it were possible, they would have already done it. Detsra says all conditions need to be met, and even they, the casters, do not know what they are. Sebastian says the only method left is to keep searching for them on foot. Somebody opens the door, saying that the prince has been located. Sebastian asks where, and the man says he's near Delane Street. Sebastian realizes that's where Lloyd's group is, asking if they may have made contact with him yet. The man says it doesn't seem like it. Sebastian says that's a relief, and they should send the Crimson Flame Squad after them. He sighs in relief, saying now he can bring his highness back. We jump to Delane Street as a robed man is walking into an alley and more follow, and Lloyd turns, asking if they have business with him. They say that they're here to get Prince Alford. Lloyd asks if he looks like Alford to them, and they start to think about it since they have been told that he's not in his right mind, and they tell him they've been ordered to bring him to a certain place. If he resists, this is all for his sake. Sarati jumps in, asking Lloyd if he's okay. She begins to release her aura, which is now blue, and she asks if they really think she would let them take the prince. Karnak's purple necromancer aura also begins to gather, and they wonder what the sudden chill is as they see multiple wraiths in the sky. They recognize it as the evil spirit of a necromancer. The wraiths fly in and start attacking the men, and they can't believe that a necromancer is taking control of the prince. They don't know how to face the wraiths, so they just run away. But as they're running, green portals open up, and they start to get tentate on the spot. One of them gets crushed to death, and the people outside of the alleyway see this and begin to run away. Lloyd is terrified by this, asking if this is really magic. We jump to two days ago at the hideout. Lloyd asks Karnak to elaborate on what this bait is. We see him eating all elegantly. Karnak says that necromancers, scared of being ousted, often don't reveal themselves unless it is to fight a strong enemy. That's why they're going to set an enemy with the same conditions, a necromancer, as bait. Lloyd spits out his water all over Karnak. Karnak says they'll expect them not to call the order on them as they will join forces with the necromancers as well. Since necromancers can steal each other's power to become stronger, they will undoubtedly appear. Lloyd says that collaborating with a necromancer is still too much, and Karnak says it will only look like he did. If they use the confiscated belongings of the necromancers and use magic to trick them, it will be indistinguishable to the typical necromancer. Of course, he is lying to this dude. Lloyd says he sees, and it would be great to go with that plan. Sarati hopes that she's not the one who has to act like the necromancer. But of course she was, and now she's depressed. Karnak asks Lloyd if he's hurt, and he says that, thanks to Sarati, he's fine. That aside, it really looked like necromancy even though he knew it was actually magic. Karnak says that's a relief. Sarati says if only he knew the truth. Lloyd says he saw one escape, asking if that was enough. Karnak says yes, as the one who ran away will report it, and that they will just have to sit here and wait until the necromancers take the bait. It jumps back to Alfred's supporters' hideout where they're discussing the necromancy. The survivor from the attack says that they all died and he witnessed it with his own eyes. Sebastian is speechless, unable to believe that Lloyd is cooperating with necromancers. Detsra says that's their specialty and to leave it to them. We see both Borson and Jelfarent, who are now called Kale and Ult for some reason. Sebastian says that Detsra's skills are trustworthy, so he'll leave it to him to make sure they get Lloyd here. Detsra is happy, saying that since they took down the Crimson Flame Squad, they aren't just normal necromancers, and he'll take every drop of their power. At Delane Street, Detsraz is telling Borson and Jelfarent that the plan is simple, 
The necromancers are definitely aiming for their powers, so they will use a decoy to lure them out and then ambush them. If it succeeds, he'll give them half of the power. Detsraz decides it's time to begin, and we see Borson invoking the name of Tesrainik as he starts to summon the spirits of dead knights, commanding them to find their master's enemies in the name of the darkness as they start to wander the street. Back at the hideout, Karnak says it's as expected, they also sent a necromancer, and his surveillance magic has tracked them. Lloyd asks if all of those ghosts are after them, and Barros laughs, saying he really rushed himself here. Karnak tells them it's time to get moving and that they'll be going by themselves this time. Lloyd asks if he really doesn't have to go. Karnak says it would be bad if they were ambushed, and they'll question the necromancers and come back with the information. Lloyd says he'll leave it to them, but he's curious as to why they're bringing a mop and a pan with them. Karnak says it may look silly, but this is optimal anti-cultist armament. Back to the soldiers' ghosts, they start going in and out of families' houses, interrupting their dinners and nights, causing them to scream. Sarati is angry that they're involving the innocent, but Barros says they're not harming anybody, so it's not that bad. She asks if they really have two, and he says that more corpses would mean more servants. She asks if this is the normal thought process of all necromancers, and he says maybe not everyone, as one of the ghosts appears right behind him and scares her. Borson's lamp makes a funny sound, and he says that one spirit is dead and wonders where it was. He turns around, feeling the power of darkness, and tells all of his minions to go this way. Jelfarant tells him it's time to go, as we see Barros and Sarati fighting. Borson says it must be them. Jelfarant notices something odd, Barros is fighting with a mop and Sarati with a frying pan. They wonder what the hell is going on. Jelfarant suggests it must be some kind of necromancy they don't know about. Telepathically, Barros tells Sarati it's time to start the plan. They both start to scream, and Borson says they're up to something. They continue their attacks, and Borson realizes they need to take care of them now. He summons a necromantic field called the Sinking Swamp of the Dead. Barros is surprised, realizing they've got some skills this time. One of the hands from the swamp stretches out towards Barros, who recognizes it's a necromantic field, and it's time to get moving. He starts to dance around like the absolute chat he is, avoiding all the hands, leaving Borson confused, wondering why this is actually working. Then we see Sarati stomp on one of the hands as she unelegantly bounces from arm to arm, and Borson wonders what the hell is going on. They finally get out of the field, and Barros says it's time to start. They throw their mop and pan into the air, and Borson and Jelfarent both look up, wondering what's about to happen. They stab their swords into the ground, releasing a green aura that begins to completely devour the necromantic field in front of them. Borson is shocked, saying he can't believe their swamp got deleted so quickly. They catch their weapons, and Barros says they won't face them with such tricks. Borson wonders what spells they're using, and Jelfarent takes off his cloak, saying he can handle this. Jelfarent starts to channel the power of hell, turning his body into that of a demon, growing large in size, and screaming, like that guy from earlier I forgot his name. Sarati recognizes that he's demonized. Karnak says he'll leave it to her, and she runs in, trading blow for blow with Jelfarent. Jelfarent says she must have strengthened herself quite a bit to block that, but she's no match for his demonic form. She laughs, saying he's not much for having turned himself into such a weird form. He gets hella angry, saying he's going to end this here as he takes a deep breath of copium and spits out a beam of hopium instead that goes straight towards Sarati. She begins to swirl her pan and slams her sword into the ground, completely destroying his beam attack. Jelfarent is speechless and clearly gassed out. Borson says that whenever they swing their weapons, all of their attacks get blocked, and they wonder what exactly is happening. We see Karnak from afar, laughing like the villain he is, saying they're so clueless and that it literally is doing nothing. Karnak explains further that the frying pan and mop are mere distractions to hide the power of darkness. Even if they believe this story, they should figure it out soon. Borson says that's odd and wonders exactly what's going on, saying that the necromancers are here but the death energy is coming from somewhere else. He turns, spotting Karnak up on a balcony, and says it looks like it's coming from over there. He realizes he's been getting played the entire time. He tells Jelfarent to stop wasting his time with these fools since they're only distractions for someone else. He points to Karnak, saying the real necromancer is on the roof. Barros and Sarati realize they've been figured out, and Barros says it's time to end it here. They leap forward directly towards Jelfarent who screams, saying they've already figured out their spells and asking if they really think he'd fall for that. He shoots out a beam directly towards Karnak, exploding the balcony where he was standing, and he laughs, saying that was nothing. Karnak calls them idiots, 
asking if they're happy they figured it out, and says that he's perfectly fine. And even if their weapons are ordinary, who said they can't kill with them. As Jelfarent turns too slowly, he gets smacked in the head by both the mop and the frying pan. We see them restrained by Karnak's aura, and they are both unconscious. Barrow slaps them, telling them to wake up, and they start telling them just to wait and see. But they immediately see Karnak's aura and realize he's much stronger than everyone else they've faced, that he's a real necromancer. Karnak says they should all have a nice chat. Jelfarent and Borson and exchange glances, realizing they definitely can't deal with him, but they can't become a nuisance either. Their hearts begin to beat at a rapid rate and expand until they explode in their chests as they commit sewer slide. Sarati and Barrows comment that those dudes are not sane, and Karnak says what they did is pointless, asking how they are even necromancers. He starts to tug on their spirits, asking them where they think they're going, and pushes them down into a pool of his aura, saying he can talk to them somewhere else. They ask what they're going to do with the bodies, and Karnak says they can just take them in case they're needed later. Since Lloyd reported there were three followers, that means there's still one more necromancer who can be used as bait. Sarati asks why the last one hasn't made a move yet. Karnak says he has no idea, but Barros looks at the lantern, saying this is perfect evidence. We see Detsra is nervously sitting on a rooftop, saying he never had the chance to intervene and didn't think they'd die so fast. He admits they definitely let their guard down and wonders what to do now, saying he can't tell how skilled Karnak really is, but he also can't just let them go. He needs to follow them and take away all three of their powers. At some abandoned house in the slums, Karnak is talking to the spirits, saying they need to tell him everything they know. They introduce themselves as Kale and Old, so Borson and Jelfarn are their last names. They say that, following the orders of Cardinal Huddle, who is in charge of the Eustil Kingdom, they were told to intervene in the following events alongside the bishop. Karnak asks if they mean Bishop Detsras. They confirm that Detsras is a necromancer within the order and also a fifth circle mage who's receiving orders from the higher ups as they go through their mission. Karnak says he must be the last one hiding and tells them to forget about anything else, asking how they managed to pierce through the holy barrier and cast a curse to swap the bodies. Borson says they had no need to pierce the barrier because the target of the curse wasn't Lloyd but Alford. Karnak asks if that means Alfred cast a curse on himself for this plan, and they explain that by utilizing the curse to switch bodies between bloodlines, they could easily go through with their plan as long as they had Alfred, even if they didn't have access to Lloyd. Karnak asks if the target has to agree for the curse to go through, and they explain that they used a magic mirror to show Lloyd's appearance, making it look like he was participating in the curse. All they had to do was use necromancy to fix the issues with the magic spell to perform an impossible curse. Karnak asks why they even swap the bodies in the first place if there's nothing to gain from that weak body. The wall behind them cracks as they go to explain, and a green aura instantly blasts through, destroying the souls. Detsra says this is the end and they'd better surrender now. Karnak asks who he's talking to, and Detsra turns, surprised, asking how they managed to dodge that. Karnak says he has good intuition. Detsra realizes he needs to step in. He begins to chant, and a frost-like aura begins to envelop the area as he says, shadows of the bitter cold come forth and open the night of Acheron. The entire area ices over, and ice werewolves appear. Sarati notes the entire area has changed, and Karnak says it's similar to when they face Strath. Barros says they're about the same status too, in that both mage and necromancy powers are used together. Sarati asks if that means it's dangerous, and Karnak says it wasn't much of an issue last time either and all they have to do is apply a barrier just like they did with Strath. As Karnak's purple aura begins to envelop the room, it consumes all the ice, turning it back into water as the ice furries melt. Detsras yells, asking how his barrier disappeared and says he didn't expect this, realizing he can't let his guard down. But he says this isn't the end, as he has power given to him by Tesrainik. He then begins to summon some wraiths from the ground as they fly from a crack and float around the room. Barros notes that they're similar in that they both try to use numbers to their advantage, asking if they should run away. Karnak asks why they would do that when they just need to defeat him, as we see him summon an army of magic bullets, absolutely obliterating the wraiths in front of him with ease. He says they're not the same as they were before. If you've watched till the end comment, Popeyes, to let me know. Subscribe for more videos like this, leave a like or a comment to help the channel out. Thanks for watching.